a black sheep living in society where everybody's happy with their spoon fed false reality. CNN and Fox News spinning us a half true. One sided tweets and blurbs, two wings on the same bird. It's time for Fletcher. This truth unfiltered Some people call him the bow tie killer It's time for Fletcher Long Every story has two sides A little right, a little wrong Let freedom ring through your radio Come on, let's start the show One thing I know for certain The truth Good morning, and this is a very special long version this morning because uh, it's Veterans Day, for one, and because I have the privilege uh, and distinct privilege to get to interview a man that has done so much in his lifetime that it's difficult to determine exactly where to begin. Um, I've been nervous in my trial career. I can remember walking up to the podium to cross-examine uh, key witnesses and big cases covered on television and thinking, oh, my God, there's there's so much here that I don't know if I'll do it justice. And that's kind of the feeling I have this morning. There's so much about Jack O'Halloran that one can uh, interview or inquire or into which they can in inquire. that It's really hard, frankly, to 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 know where to begin. But without any further ado, Eric, if my voice levels are sounding pretty good, you're fine. Go you're doing good. You're fine. Yep. Yeah. I've, I've kind of built out my studio a little bit for today. I'm really excited. Uh, Jack, are you with us? No, he's not as with us as of yet. Hold on. Stand by. Okay. I'm, I'm going to okay. get him on the air. You just continue. We're going to get him. We're going to get him on. Right. Uh, Jack O'Halloran, uh, was, uh, grew up, I think in Runny Mead, uh, uh, New Jersey, I believe, uh, uh was a professional boxer. Uh, one of the ranking, one of the uh, a very high ranking contender for the heavyweight championship has morning. fought. Okay, hey, now, good morning, uh, Jack. Now, Thank have, you so much for Jack. Joining you're us. live on the air with Fletcher Long. Good morning, Jack. How are you? <laughs> I'm uh, doing the best I can. Whatever that guy upstairs will let me get away with. There you go. All right. Here's your <laughs> Jack. Uh, th this is this is internet radio, baby. So you can let her rip. But uh, thank you so much for joining us today, and I'm really excited. I, I guess where I want to start is, um, and I have read somewhere, and, and I want to say hello to Steve Joyner, who helped make this interview possible, and what a fantastic guy he is. I know he's a very good friend of yours, but I, I want to ask you this question, Jack. I read somewhere, you're 15 years old, you're growing up you in, in, in an Irish household, and you find out that your father uh, is Albert Anastasia. Uh, what was that event like? What, 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 what came into your mind when that occurred? Well, you know, um, I, I had always, I always had a feeling that something was um, different in my life. You know, um, and, and I lived in, a, and I lived in a neighborhood that was. Um, Irish Catholic primarily, you know, uh, except right next door, uh, an Italian family from Sicily moved in, the Pagano family, <laughs> the Paganini family. And uh, they were, uh, 
I found out years later, that, you know, that they were that they moved there because someone directed them there. But they were the nicest people in the world. You know, I, I learned how to speak Italian, and they, you know, they um, never thought much about it. You know, it's just uh, it was. Uh, you know, it, it took a couple of years before it really, until I was like uh, 16, 17 years old, that it really sunk in, you know. Um, and I, I uh, met uh, Meyer Lansky and some other people from New York uh, when I was uh, 17, 18 years old. And, now, uh, now, now, Jack, I want to cut you off a little bit because every now and again I want to catch the listeners up. There are some listeners, believe it or not, that may not know uh, who Albert Anastasia is. So, if I, Albert Anastasio, his, his, his An- Anastasia, his real, his given name was Umberto Anastasio. Uh, he, he was um, head of Murder Incorporated, which was kind of the enforcement arm of the syndicate. Uh, he was friends with Lucky Luciano, Bugsy Siegel, Meyer Lansky. Uh, in the early days of the Gambino crime family, he was underboss. So the reason why Italians would have been directed to live next to you in this Irish Catholic neighborhood was that uh, if, you know, if, if, the, if, if rivals in the syndicate were to learn that Albert Anastasia has a son over in this Irish Catholic neighborhood, they could use uh, your existence to put pressure on him to extort him or do whatever. And so they were kind of there to protect you. I just wanted to kind of fill that in. So, so this is about what we're talking here. Yeah, I, you know, I, I had a um, a man in my life uh, who came in my life when I was very young. Uh, a guy by the name of Rip Collins, who was uh, Tommy Collins' uh, cousin from Ireland, who was the famous uh, Irish uh, military guy from the. Uh, from the black and tan 1920s Irish revolution days. Uh, and Rip was, a, Rip was a very, very, very bright guy. He was a, a top engineer at General Electric. And he also ran the waterfront, the IRA in Philadelphia. Okay. Uh, and he was, uh, he was very good friends with my father because my father ran the ports. My father ran all the ports on the East Coast. And my father spent a lot of time in in the in the Philadelphia area, and he was uh, in the in the early '40s. Albert was in the army. I was, which is a funny story. Uh, Albert went in the army, uh, and he, he was a sergeant in Indiana, Pennsylvania, Indian Gap, Pennsylvania, uh, teaching soldiers how to be longshoremen. And never spent a night at the barracks, but he was he was in the army, and it was a way of getting him out of the way because of the, it was a very high area of of his popularity, and uh, and they had just executed uh, his partner uh, in um, who was a top union guy, uh, and then his partner in Murder Incorporated, and they had executed him in, in New York, and. Uh, Albert became uh, like a focal pinpoint of being looked after every day. To be looking for him here, or there, he'd be in the papers all over the place, and uh, and he's sitting in the army in, in Indiana, and uh, and the guy who was the captain of his platoon calls uh, the New York police and says, um, "This guy Albert Anastasia, you people are looking for." all over the place. He said, uh, he's right here in my army. And the guy said, what? He said that, that this Albert Anastasia guy that you're all looking for, he said, that he's, he's right here in my army. And the guy said, hold on a minute. And he come back and he said, we're not really looking for Albert Anastasia. That's all just the publicity in the newspapers and all that stuff. That's the kind of power these guys had. Yeah. And, and, and I want everybody to understand when I mean, you're talking yeah. about Hey, Jack, hang, hang on one second. I want everybody to understand it. When you're talking about uh, the, uh, the, the mafiosi, that the United States government has had on and off and on again, off again relationship that was symbiotic between, between the government and, and the syndicate. 
uh, they haven't always been acrimonious. In fact, J. Edgar Hoover rather famously uh, denied the existence of the American mafia just about until uh, he left the bureau. So, and and uh, much of that denial was because of the fact that he and the United States government uh, you, you used the syndicate uh, for its own um, goals a lot. So it, it 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 it's a very it's a very intricate and complex relationship that uh, uh, these people that we have vilified the Myra Lanskys, the uh, Bugsy Siegels, the uh, uh, the that we, these people that we have vilified have done a lot really for America, even at the uh, United States government's. Uh, uh, agreement they they've done things for America and they're they're not always villainous is is what I'm trying to say. Would you say that that's correct? Yeah, I mean uh, you have to you have to understand that um, when they in, in 1939, um, my father handed them uh, a guy who was the number one man on the hip parade for uh, for crime and it was the first real gangster that uh, that that they ever the fbi ever really captured and they really never captured him he was handed to them and it's because the he he uh, was being searched for for two years my father hit him for two years and then they made a deal with walter winchell and walter winchell brokered the deal and the guy walked from my father's car to uh to Hoover's car, and and Hoover captured this individual, and, and they, and there was a big deal, blah blah blah, and the FBI became very valid, and they got funding, and, uh, and Hoover, who was very close to Costello and a lot of people in New York, and uh, he, um, they just never, you know, they were, you, you got to understand that in the, in an era from the, from the twenties on up. Um, Government, industry, organized crime, and unions were all partners. Yeah, they all interfaced, and and there was a lot of there was a lot of illicit monies that um, went into uh, that came from organized crime that went into legitimate businesses. They created jobs. They they owned the insurance companies. They owned construction companies. They. A, the longshoremen. Uh, there were there were a lot of jobs that were created through the efforts of organized crime. They uh, they wanted people to work. They wanted people to have money in their pocket. Because right. if you didn't have money in your pocket, you couldn't gamble. You couldn't borrow money. You couldn't because the government in those days getting a loan uh, from for from a bank was was like an impossibility for a lot of people. Right. A lot of people were immigrants who just came over from other countries, and uh, and and so they, you know, they 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 had the American dream of working their way through this and that. And you know, it's like people. My, I, I tell people sometimes. I said, you know, you want to know the definition of a tough guy, uh, a man who who went to work every day and took care of his family under all the adverse conditions that these people worked under. Uh, coming into the country and learning a new language, and 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 one of the things that that, that always disturbs me about today and the era of the of the 1900s and then late 1800s and early 1900s is that all the immigration that came into America wanted to be Americans, and they all when they took the oath of of being a citizen, they raised their hand. They all spoke English. And even though they came with their traits and and their and their uh, nationalities and everything, they developed an American way of living. You know, a lot of people never learned the languages of their forefathers because people spoke English. Because because it was important to assimilate, and uh, that that is what you're saying. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. They they wanted sure. they wanted to be Americans. You know, it was a right. it was a whole different it was a whole different idea you know it was a they, they came into a country a strange place they yeah sure they had their they had their areas of neighborhoods the jewish and the, and the italians and the irish and you know uh, the germans and, the, and everybody had their own neighborhoods and and there was conflicts amongst them but they grew through them they became stronger they united 
and went to war together. They, you know, World War One was a big deal in America, where where America, after World War One, America became a war-bearing country. Well, and 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 I want everybody to understand too uh, about the mafia uh, that. Um, and people say, well, Long, you sound like you're you're glorifying them or, or deifying them, and, and I'm not. What The mafia considers itself an army. Is, is that well, right, Jack? They, I mean, they, it, it, when it, they, you got to understand, if you really look at how they came and how they set up, they set up in America like the Roman legions. They, right. they, they set up and, and they ran the mafia with capos and and lieutenants and uh, and just like Roman soldiers, right? Uh, but they set up in all the port cities, from uh, from De- Detroit and Buffalo and uh, New York and Philadelphia uh, and Florida and New Orleans and uh, and then in the center of the country, Chicago, Kansas City. Uh, they they set up in in all the areas where the country interfaced and and how transportation and, and going back and forth and the growth of a nation and they were involved in uh, you know people came into all different ports and and took up residencies and they they went from new york inland and they went from buffalo inland and they went from florida inland and they went from new orleans inland a lot of people came into new orleans in 1850 and worked their way up through the country into kansas city and chicago you know, so you had um, you had a tremendous influx of yeah, people, and 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 the point I the point I'm making is is that uh, the the syndicate generally uh, didn't have violence that spilled over into what they considered civilians. I mean, sure, it happened from time to time, but they can the, you know once you became a soldier in this particular uh, syndicate. Then you know it was it was like uh, serving in the army. Your life was uh, in jeopardy. Uh, your your father's life was almost always in jeopardy because of what he did. But uh, you know it was not. Uh, it it was it it was considered somewhat that uh, if if they won't police uh, the Italian neighborhood, then who's going to keep the peace among these influx of immigrants? And, and it turned out that it was going to be this syndicate. Well, is that, is that accurate or? Yeah. You, you know, you had, um, uh, a whole different, uh, concept of, uh, of, 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 of people, you know, the Italians, the Italians were, were underdogs in, in, uh, in 1880, 1890, and 1900. Uh, the Germans actually ran New York first. No one ever really believed that, you know. Um, there was uh, like a, 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 an order, a pecking order that came about. How one, it's amazing how one group uh, took over certain things, uh, took over certain things in, uh, uh, each city and how they grew and how they, how they became, uh, um, how they became, uh, united together. You know, like my father was, was uh, when they, when they formed murder incorporated, uh, Lewis Lepke Buckholder was, uh, a very heavy union guy in New York and he was Jewish and murder incorporated itself was predominantly made up of Jewish people it was 80% Jewish men, Jewish, Jewish hit men. And, and the Jewish people did something in America that they never did in other parts of the world. They were killers. They actually killed people the, everywhere else. They were always the bankers. They handled right. all the money, and they still handled the money in in, in America, but hey, they hey, had Jack. another arm. Of, yeah. Hey, Jack, we got to go to break. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna break here, and when we come back, we will pick up where we left off. You're getting the long version of Jack O'Halloran. Moving to Clarksville, being stationed at Fort Campbell, or just moving to the Middle Tennessee, Southern Kentucky areas, go see my friend Matt McWhorter in the mortgage division of F and M Bank. 
Matt and FNM are in the American dream business and they want to help your family achieve the American dream. They are located at 15 different Clarksville, Tennessee locations, or you can call Matt McWhirter at 931-245-4274. Reach out to Matt McWhirter on email at matt, M-A-T-T, dot M-C-W-H-I-R-T-E-R at myfmbank.com and ask him how you can apply for your home loan right online. Contact Matt McWhirter at FNM Bank for your home loan or refinancing needs at FNM Bank, member FDIC, and equal housing lender. Are you moving to either Tennessee or Kentucky? Well, then you need to know the hottest real estate agent in the Tuckasee markets is Felicia Long Grant for Keller Williams. Moving to either Tennessee or Kentucky, getting stationed at Fort Campbell, or being transferred to another base from Fort Campbell and need to sell your home, Felicia Long Grant aligns herself with champions and delivers excellence. Ask her about the hottest properties now available in the market at Wellington Fields and the soon-to-be Stonehurst development. Call Felicia Long at 931-206-4980. That's 931-206-4980. Felicia Long Grant for Keller Williams, aligning herself with champions and delivering excellence. From criminal defense to contracts, from divorce to child custody, from military law to asset forfeiture, At the law office of Kimberly Turner & Associates, we know that sometimes bad things happen to good people. Sometimes good people just get caught up in bad situations and need someone to navigate them through a frightening and daunting system. The law office of Kimberly Turner & Associates will stand beside you and guide you through your most trying ordeals. Call her office at 931-572-1134 or check out the full array of offered services by going to kturnerlaw.com. That's the law office of Kimberly Turner & Associates, 931-572-1134, because they are the law firm who cares. This is Fletcher Long telling you that we have all been behind the wheel after having had too much to drink. Some of us have seen the blue lights in the rear view. Others of us have been lucky. Who are you going to call when your luck runs out? Here's a hint. It better be the very best. If in that situation, the decision to me is clear, I am calling Attorney Lynn Morton. Competence, diligence, skill, and tenacity are 10 digits away. Call 931-320-2484 and ask for Lynn Morton. From divorce to DUI, from criminal defense to contract, one call does it all. 931-320-2480 gets you Lynn Morton. She'll get your ox out of the ditch and put your feet back on the street. Lynn Morton, 931-320-2484. Call her. There is nothing worse than being taken in a home buy. Should have had that property inspected and by someone with integrity who would do it thoroughly and correctly. Should have had Z-Best Inspection Services. Don't let this happen to you. Call Z-Best Inspection Services at 931-980-5759 and ask for Bud Wink. The home is the most expensive and important investment the American family makes in a lifetime. You really don't want anyone inspecting it other than Z-Best. That is Z-Best Inspection Services, 931-980-5759. Write this down. 931-980-5759. Bud Wink is called Z-Best Inspection Services because he is Z-Best. Z-Best Inspection Services changing the quality of home inspections one house at a time. 
Dad, you look a little stressed. What's wrong? That's okay, Martin. You probably wouldn't understand. Come on, Dad. Try me. Ah, uh, Daddy got himself in a little bit of a mess, and I have to hire a lawyer. Is that all? <laughs> you make it sound so simple. But it is simple, Dad. How is it so simple, Martin? When you need a lawyer, dot com. It's the fast and easy way to get the legal help you need fast. How'd you get to be so smart? I'm not answering any questions without my lawyer. And just where are you going to get a lawyer? It's not rocket science, Dad. When you need a lawyer, dot com. It's that simple, huh? Yup, that's simple. When you need a lawyer, dot com. When you need a lawyer, dot com. You're getting the long version of Jack O'Halloran. Jack, when we left off, and just to catch <laughs> everybody up, um, you uh, were you are were the son. I mean, Albert Anastasia is dead now, but you you were his son. And, well, it's the illegal son, yeah. Yeah, and 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 you know, you were the impression I'm left with is you were kind of hidden out uh, and protected in an Irish Catholic neighborhood and came up Irish, but your dad aware of you protecting you all the while. Yeah. I mean, he, he was, uh, he was stationed in, in, in Indiana, Pennsylvania. Uh, he came into Philadelphia every night. Uh, and I was a romance. My mother was, a was a gorgeous woman. Um, and, uh, had a lot of uh, association with, uh, you know, people in, the, in that world. Um, she was, friends with Rip Collins. She was friends with, uh, with a lot of people from, from her area, her neighborhood and, and her and Albert hooked up and, and I was a product of it, you know, but the, when you're talking about Albert and you, you got to go back to the very beginning in, in the, uh, 18, 19, uh, 18, when he and his brothers came into America and they came into the country illegally, um, Albert couldn't go through Ellis Island. He already had problems in Italy and he was only a young guy. But to show the power, the strength that these guys had in, in the country was that, you know, he, when he went down and took the waterfront and the first murder he ever committed was like 1920. Uh, and he was convicted. He was sent to jail. He was sent to Sing Sing and he was convicted of murder. And, you know, he, uh, within 18 months, they had him out of jail uh, on a, because there was no witnesses. So they, they, they let him go um on a retrial and he was never deported like most people got in problems like that they deported them right away right. he was never deported and you know he grew up through the ranks and and rose up to be uh in and Charlie Luciano were were the best of friends and and Albert was um was an enforcer and he killed a lot of people when he was younger but all for the sake of what they did right uh, they did nothing uh, to injure anyone. So he and Lipke, when they formed Murder Incorporated, they uh, the Lipke was uh, was ahead of uh, of of a street of the unions in actuality in New York, and uh, and my father was the Italian, and they put and they had to have an Italian associated with it, and and they had a lot of power. These guys, you know, they and they and they worked out of a little candy store, uh, Midnight Roses in in Brooklyn. Um, in, in Brownsville, and, and, and amazing, and out of the back room of a candy store, and they reached across the country. There was one of the most amazing setups, the way Murder Incorporated was set up, and and to show you the power of a guy like Lipke, when they when they finally when when Albert handed Lipke to, to Hoover, and they went through three trials, and Lipke, the night he was to be executed, is in his cell. And Dewey goes down to see him and says to him, listen, you don't have to go in that chair and die. Your good friends put you here. So all you have to do is talk to me about your good friends and I can make your life very easy in jail and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, and, and you're speaking of Thomas Dewey, who ran oh, yeah. against Truman for president of the United States and at yeah. the time was the attorney general of New York. He was the, of the attorney general of New York, right. right. He was lead prosecutor. So he... You know, and uh, and he's making a name for himself, and he's chasing organized crime guys, and uh, 
and he was two faced. He actually worked both sides of the street. Well, sure, that's that's not uncommon in government at all. If if the, if the citizens he's knew trying how to make often, it, yeah. And Lipke looked at him, even back then. <laughs> so Lipke looked him right in the eye, and Lipke said, "Well." He said, you know, if my good friends wanted me here, they must have had a good reason for it. So yeah. why don't you just, you know, piss off, in other words, and, and walk down this aisle, take me down the aisle, put me in a chair and pull the switch. You know, in other words, get out of my face, go to hell, which floored Dewey. Dewey couldn't believe that this guy had that kind of, you know, stood up with that kind of balls, you know. And he's so, But that's the kind of people they were. They They lived by a code. Right. And they died by that code. You know, I've oft, I, you know, Jack, I've often heard that the reason why the Myra Lanskys and Bugsy Siegels, who, who were Jewish, the reason why the mafia became uh, largely Italian to all Italian uh, uh, to, in order to, to really rank in that particular system is because the, the Jewish mobsters did not aspire for their children to follow them where the Italian mobsters uh, didn't mind so much if their children followed them. And so many of the Jewish mobsters' children went into what they call legitimate business. Now, a lot of their business was not all that entirely legitimate either. But, you know, in, in America, we have the caught and the uncaught. You know, that, that's really everyone's a criminal, as Johnny Cochran once said. We just have the caught and the uncaught. And and the only real color anybody sees anymore is green, was, was Johnny Cochran's commentary. Uh, but, uh, is, is that, is, did you find that to be true that the, that the, uh, well, Jewish to, mobsters... you know, to, to, to a degree, I mean, the Jewish people were, were majority business people, you know, very serious bankers and money people. Uh, they, uh, you know, and, and Italians and, and a lot of Italian people, they, they they didn't want a lot of their sons following all the way through their foots. They tried to make them legitimate. Right. You know, like it was depicted in The Godfather. Yeah. Uh, he really wanted Michael Corleone to become a senator. He, he didn't want him to follow in his footsteps. Right. Uh, I was left in Philadelphia and my father really didn't want me involved in what was going on in New York and, and stuff. And, uh, um, and neither my, my uh, stepbrother, young Albert, never got involved. He, he, he graduated from Fordham University. Right. Uh, and and uh, my stepsisters, you know, married very inf affluent people. Um, Albert's brother uh, Tony Anastasi, who was like the waterfront guy when they did the movie on the waterfront, it was about Tony Anastasi. He actually was the legitimate guy who ran the waterfronts unions, only because of the strength of my father behind him. Yeah. Uh, so you you had to understand the the lineage of how these people uh, put things together and tried to better their families and better make a better way of life for people. Uh, and they possessed the power uh, that this country will never see again, that the way that they were all partners with the government and everything and, and the way that everything works so fluidly. And, you know, and if you go back in that era, I mean, when I was raised in Philadelphia, we never locked our front doors. You never right. had you never had drive by shootings in the neighborhood. Nobody you never saw a gun, for God's sake. Only criminals had guns, you know. And it, it, even Lipke himself would have never had the trouble he had had he done what they what they had coded to do. He should have killed the guy that turned out to be a rat. He should have killed him. He had him, and he, and he and the guy did something. He broke all the rules, and 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 he gave him a beating. And instead of killing him, he gave him a beating, and it petrified the guy. And the guy started ratting, and he ratted for. He was the one that brought Murder Incorporated down. He put like eleven guys on death row. Let me ask you this: and broke up a group that would have never been broken up. Now, and in, in, out of ignorance, to whom are you referring? A, a, his name was Abe a Battelle. He was uh, he, he the he he was kept at a place called. He was the first witness protection program guy. They held him in the in the Half Moon Hotel in Staten Island for a couple of years while he fed the information to the FBI and, and to uh, the courts and everything. 
and he was riding on this guy and riding on that guy. And he died the night before he was supposed to go to trial against my father. Uh-huh. He was in, he was being kept in the half moon hotel and he turned out to be a little porky pig guy because they kept him under guard and they kept him under guard 24 seven. Yeah. Yet the night before he was supposed to go to trial, he went out the window and they said, oh, well, he climbed, tried to climb out the window to escape and he fell, but he hit the floor 20 feet away from the building. Yeah. He, he was so, one hell of a jumper. I yeah, think. somebody chucked him out a window and, and sure. he was being watched 24 seven by the police. Right. Right. So to, which shows you the camaraderie of, of all the stuff that went on. And he was supposed to testify against Albert, uh, that the next day. And that was the end. So they never, Albert was never deported. Albert was never, he, and we spent a year in jail here or a year in jail there, but he never really spent any serious hard time anywhere. And, uh, and, jail in those days for those guys was a cakewalk it was a whole different mm-hmm. concept um but they they built something and they and they lived by a code you know they called albert the mad hatter and stuff way well, because they killed so many people but they they lived by by a deal that if you came into their world you played by a set of rules if you broke the rules you knew the consequences right and Albert right. always said that if he if he had if you broke his rules and he said, oh, that's OK, don't worry about it. You know, we'll take care of it like they do today. A lot of things, you know, uh, this guy's a good guy. We'll give him another chance. He said, you know, you're going to turn me over and 10 years later, you're going to put me in jail. You're going to rat on me. Right. Because you're going to take my kindness as a weakness. Hey, and- Eric, uh, hang, hang on a second, Jack. Hey, Eric. Are you there? I am here, uh, Fletcher. Okay. I'm going to float this break, this next break, okay? I'm just going to float right through it because okay. so, so we can stay here. So we'll, we'll break at the top of the hour, but 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 we won't break at the 40s. Can I, can I just say good morning to Jack? Hi, Jack. <laughs> good morning, Eric. How you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? <laughs> I was appreciating that commercial. I was listening. Boy, I tell you, Fletcher, you, got a, you have a great commercial voice. You should please oh. bring you out here to Hollywood. Well, I, t- I tell you what, don't, I need don't a, tell I him. Need, don't you tell him that. Don't you tell him that, Jack. He'll be on the plane. He'll be waiting. At, he'll be waiting at L.A. Airport tonight. <laughs> no, so, but I got to. I got to. So, so go ahead. I'll let you do I'm, your things, guys. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Eric. Sorry. Um, so, so Jack, um, you go in and and um, you start playing football, and you are a very accomplished football player. Uh, tell us about that because it, well, I, when I was when, like you know. this gentleman, Rip Collins, when I was a kid, he, he started to train me. He taught me things like, uh, uh, he, he was a really bright guy and, and he, he taught me how to think and taught me how to use my mind. And he used to play a, used to play a game with me. He would make, have me make a list of, of, of 50 objects. And, and go down the list and he would give me two minutes to read this list. And then he would give me a number and I would give him the object. He'd give me an object, I'd give him the number. So he taught me how to put a puzzle in my head okay. to remember things and to put things in proper perspective. And then he, he trained me in martial arts. He trained me in, uh, in discipline. He trained me in, 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 in a lot of ways that were very beneficial for me in my life which helped me tremendously as an athlete, you know, and, uh, and he, he actually, he was like, he was like a surrogate father. Yeah. Um, because the man that my mother was married to was, a, a, an Irishman. He drank too much and, you know, he, he wasn't a bad guy, but he knew I wasn't his child. And, right. and I felt that all the time. So this Irish guy was always there for me. Uh, whenever I needed some, he was always, and he kept me out of trouble. I mean, when I got into little scrapes and things like that in the streets, the, the it disappeared. I never had a record. I never had a juvenile record. Uh, the, the captain of the police force was a cousin of his. And, you know, it was it was amazing how the tightness of, of, of things was in those days. You understand? Right. Uh, and when I and I remember when I was. Uh, Oh, I was uh, 17, 18 years old, and, and, and people came to me in, with an envelope with uh, a whole bunch of letters from my father, writings, and, and, uh, 
and a bunch of money and, and a new car, and a car and, and all kinds of things. And, and people tour me to meet in New York and, uh, and my introduction to Meyer. And, and there was people in my neighborhood that I, I met that ran the area. Uh, Felix Picchio, who was uh, from Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania, but he ran Mount Lee from New Jersey. And, and we had moved from Philadelphia into South Jersey when the Walt Whitman Bridge was built. And, and he ran that whole area. And he was Joe Walcott's manager and he was ran boxing along with Frankie Carbo. And yeah, you know, and you're and, and, and you're talking about Jersey Joe Walcott, one, one of the great heavyweight fighters of yeah. in the history of the sport. Oh, yeah. He was uh, I mean, Felix was Felix was a powerhouse and he was and you never hear much about him, but he was one of the guys behind the scenes who was a real powerhouse. And he. He, uh, he 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 got he had to leave Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania, because of his villainous activities, and he wound up in New Jersey. Uh, and I, he was very much involved in boxing because boxing was controlled in those days. Yeah, and I, I want you. I want to take you to uh, Dallas, uh, Texas. It's nineteen. It's nineteen sixty-three. Yeah. yeah, you're you're there trying out for the Cowboys. Oh, that was it. Uh, they what they did was they put together a thing uh, for me to go down and it was a ploy for me to be somewhere to see things okay. they were always educating me i was always being educated and shown things and uh, uh and, uh, like on the from behind the like from behind the curtain you understand right and uh, and they took me down to introduced me to uh, I'm actually involved in the, in the cowboy organization when they first built the Cowboys and the Cowboys were owned by um, the Murchison family, Clint Murchison Jr. He owned the Dallas Cowboys. He owned the, the stadium they played in I mean, the Murchison family. Clint Murchison Sr. was the wealthiest man in the world. Okay. Uh, and his son, uh, Clint Murchison Jr. He was more flamboyant than his father. His father was, was more of a, a of an introvertal guy who just was he was the first person to hit oil, uh, the first guy in America to hit oil on the outside shores and stuff. And uh, he was very big in the oil business. And uh, so his son though was a little bit more flamboyant, and he had this ranch, this property in in Dallas that was like a ranch in the center of the, in, in the city. Yeah, right. And he had so he held this huge party. And called Egyptian Nights, was yeah. it? Was that was that the, the party? party was taking? was in honor of, of J. Edgar Hoover. Okay, it was, part, it was a party inv- involving J. Edgar Hoover, and, and and at that party was was McCoy, the banker from New York, and four other bankers, and uh, a lot of powerful people. And the, you know, Nixon was there, and uh, and uh, um, now now I want to interject. Bush was there, and yeah, and LBJ I, 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 was there. I want to interject yeah. now. Now the Bush that was there, was it was it George H. W. Bush? Was it Prescott Bush? Or 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 it was, it was George, George? Yeah, George George. Yeah, H. W. Bush. And he, uh, he, he, was, was, he was he was head of the CIA at the time. He was head of the CIA. Correct. A, part, a yeah. party for J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI. Yeah. Uh, and a not a fan of Kennedy. No. Is that, is that a and, and what and, and the ironic part was, I went there and saw all these people, this conglomeration of people that they're all chattering with each other, and I was pointed out to me who this person was, that person was, that person was, and I had met McCoy and I became good friends. He lived in Connecticut, and uh, he was a powerhouse boy, and, and what a nice guy. But when Johnson came in late because they were in, in Dallas Fort Worth airport and they were in Fort Worth when Kennedy arrived in uh, and Johnson was with him when they arrived up in the Fort Worth airport and then Johnson came into the party late it was like you know, 12 30 one o'clock in the morning something like that and everybody congregated and went into a room and disappeared with with and, Lyndon and, with Lyndon Johnson with Lyndon Johnson yeah right okay and and I left you know it was time to go uh, once they all went into this room, was, you know, I left, but I found out later that they were discussing what was going to happen the next day. And, uh, and Madeline Brown, who was Lyndon Johnson's, uh, uh, mistress, and I had met her that night and she was a, an interesting woman. And she tells the story afterwards, you know, about what Johnson told her and stuff of that nature after they come out of the meeting. But what people don't understand is that. 
Johnson and the CIA and the mafia and the unions all were used as puppets in yeah, structuring. I, hey, Jack, I want everybody to understand that what you came to learn was being discussed in that room was shooting the president of the United States. Well, it was, it was already orchestrated that he was going to die the next day. Okay, that, that's what I want. I don't want. I don't want to be the least bit obsequious. I want to be so clear that they were going. They were going to kill the president of the United States. Lyndon Johnson knew about it. Uh, maybe even George H. W. Bush knew about it. Well, they uh, all knew about it. Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. Every one of them. They all. They. They all. They all knew what was coming down, but they were not the perpetrators of it. They followed orders. There was a schematic laid out, and it was laid out by a much higher power of people. Uh, and, and it, you know, when you look at John Kennedy's death and you say, well, geez, who would be the guy responsible? Because there's so many fingers were pointed in so many different ways, and there was such a huge conspiracy orchestrated and all this other bull, you know, and uh, how this guy was involved and the unions were involved and uh, – and Hoffa was involved, and and uh, and and that Lyndon Johnson was a was a key component. Well, it affected Lyndon Johnson because if Lyndon, if John Kennedy didn't die the day he died, ten days later, Lyndon Johnson would have been indicted with Billy Saul Lestis and and Brown they, they, when they all got indicted on the land swindle deal in uh, in the United States down in Arkansas and Alabama and stuff. Uh, Johnson was involved in that. He would have went to jail. Uh, he would have been indicted. But yeah. he was a president of the United States, so that was the end of his indictment. You understand? It, it's it, yeah, it's uh, hard to indict the president of the United States. That no, sure. was the end of his indictment. So, they, uh, but the other guys went to jail. Uh, and the but the what came out of that whole thing was you know, and, and I remember um, I got up and did road work the next morning before I left Dallas. Uh, and I was out running, and I was running with a guy, an infamous guy from uh, from Chicago. And uh, and he said to me, uh, you know, you're getting out of town, right, kid? And I said, yeah, I'm, they're, I'm leaving in a couple hours. He said, good, you got to get out of here. Because they didn't want me there when the actual deed happened. You understand? Right. But right. The, the thing that if you were going to turn around and say, if you made a statement of saying who was one key person, who is responsible for the death of John F. Kennedy? You have to look at his father. Yeah, and I want to I want to go into that for a second. Joe Kennedy, um, John F. Kennedy, and you've told me this. We we've had an opportunity to talk before today. Joe Kennedy uh, knew that John F. Kennedy was seriously uh, afflicted; that he was likely to die, whether he had been shot in Dallas, November twenty second, nineteen sixty three, or not. He was he was dying. With what was he afflicted in your mind? Oh, he had Addison's disease very bad, which was eating his back up. He had syphilis. He had four different diseases that he was uh, suffering from. I mean, they used to shoot him up every day to to take the pain, you know, to, for him to handle pain. He was not in physical shape. He looked like he was because they they shot him up every day. You know, he uh, he looked like he was fine, but he was inwardly dying. He would have never lived out his his, his turn medically. And now, 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 Jack, we have a question. Would you do you mind fielding a question? No. All right. This is from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. We got a we got a big audience. This from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma uh, wants to know. Hang on, I've got to have the question pop up here. I, I'm sorry. All right. Uh, why did they care so much if Johnson went to jail? Those seem like extreme measures. Why did they care whether he went or not? Yeah, yeah. In other words, in other because words, they they were building something that they wanted. You know, uh, they were taking, they were taking control of something, and 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 the, and the reason for it was that um, prior to Jack Kennedy becoming president, okay, uh, the oil people of Texas, you you have to understand something. In 1960. Four of the wealthiest men in the world lived in Texas. You had, and, and, and listen to what they ran. You know, you had Clint Murchison Sr., 
who was an oil baron, and he was the head of uh, of, of, of certain things in, in the world masonry and in, in the world power of order. You had George and Herman Brown, which was Brown Root, which built all the ships, all the federal buildings, all the bridges. Uh, they had contracted because the guy was out of Austin, Texas, that had the power of the pen for all that stuff. You had uh, Sid Richardson, who not very many people talk about, and H.L. Hunt, who were all oil barons, okay? And you're talking about a lot of money. And the, so you, for the wealthiest people in the world. So when Jack Kennedy was running for president, and when he, before, when he was not in his nomination days, H.L. Hunt went to L.A. with a bag full of money and gave it to his father. Joe Kennedy's father, Joe Kennedy, gave it to Joe Kennedy for Lyndon B. Johnson to be the vice president on Jack Kennedy's ticket. And when Jack Kennedy got elected, his father, the first order of business, his father turned around and said, those people in Texas have far too much money. You have to put a levy of tax against them. And changed the whole structure of the money that these people made uh, off of. The, he wanted to tax the revenue streams that they were getting on a different level. And and so and so something I've heard said before. So they angered a lot of people. Yeah, the the, 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 for, for, the Kennedy, very, very angry. The Kennedys, Joe included, turned on the very people who put well, them Joe, in that. Joe it, Joe turned on Joe turned on everyone. You have to go back to the beginning of Joe Kennedy. You know you. Joe Kennedy uh, was a brilliant guy. He really was a bright guy. He was a banker. He was the youngest president of a bank in American history. Uh, and he was the son. He was the, uh, his wife was Rose Fitzgerald. Honey Fitzgerald was a top, top guy in Massachusetts. First mayor, first senator. And uh, uh, there's a Fitzgerald sits on the bank of uh, the, the Boston bank still today. I mean, they, that was, he was a powerhouse. This guy, he controlled the Brooklyn, I mean, the Boston Harbor. He put like $4 million in there because they brought all the booze in from Scotland. They, uh, they, they he was a powerhouse. Honey Fitzgerald was a powerful guy. And Joe Kennedy married his daughter, Rose. And, and his, and Honey Fitzgerald put together the first bank that Joe was president of. And, you know, so Joe Kennedy was a smart, smart guy, but prohibition came and they controlled all the scotch and liquor that came out of Ireland and Scotland and all. And, uh, Kennedy opened up a warehouse with a guy from New Jersey who owned Fleischmann liquor and they brought booze into Canada. And then they brought it down into America during the prohibition era. They became bootleggers because it was right. huge money involved. Yeah. Right. And, and Joe Kennedy took a, a, a shipment of, of booze that belonged to the Purple Gang. And the Purple Gang were nefarious gangsters out of Detroit, Michigan. Killers, all killers. And when you did something like that to them, and they said, you know, you're dead, sunshine. You were dead. You had, you had a real problem on your hands. So Joe Kennedy ran to his stepfather and his father-in-law, and he said, Man, what am I going to do here? And they said, there's only one guy that can help you. And he's in Chicago and you got to go see that old man in Chicago. And Joe Kennedy went to Chicago and sat down with the first Don over there and expressed his problem. And the guy said to him, and this is a true story. The guy said, well, you're a very good earner, young man. So here's the deal. You go back to Boston. I'll take care of the purple gang, but you belong to us in Chicago. You understand now, who, that? now, 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 what was the name of this guy? Uh, he was, uh, Joe Esposito. Okay. Uh, who was a, who was who was involved in politics in Chicago, and he was the first Don. He was a very powerful guy and died very young, actually. He got killed, but he uh, he anyway. So he does that, and, he, and there was a place in in Chicago at that time called the Hamilton Club. Hamilton Club was a political forcers. You know, all the presidents, everybody ran through the Hamilton Club because Chicago was was a very wealthy intersectal place in America and Kansas city was below it. And, you know, a lot of the railroads and everything went through Chicago. And, um, so the Hamilton club was a powerful political stronghold for the whole country and like the New York athletic club and, uh, and the Hamilton club, they brought Joe Kennedy 
Chicago brought him into Chicago, brought him back out there. They sent him to Hollywood and they introduced him to uh, Randolph Hearst, who ran all the newspapers on the West Coast. He became very friendly with Hearst. He was involved in the, in the film business because the Chicago mob owned the projectors union. They controlled the movie industry and they sent him out to do some things. He formed RKO. If you look under the, under the weaving of RKO, he put together a lot of things that formed RKO studios and he put the distribution together with all the Jewish theater owners and put the first real distribution factor in place for the film industry, RKO Studios. Yeah. And then he became very friendly with Randolph Hearst in the twenties. And then in 1926, the Hamilton club said, you know, uh, they were being pressured by Europe for return of monies that the European money was the first money to come in to build America. When they put the first bank together in the United States, it was put together with $10 million, $9 million came from the bankers of Geneva through London and the other million came from America and they put together the first bank and they funded a lot of things in the growth of the country. The money came from Europe. And when we got into world war one, in 1916, we became a war-bearing country and started to make war surplus. So we took jobs and power away from Europe. And they said that we weren't paying them back fast enough. So in 1926, they grabbed Joe Kennedy, sat him down, and they said, listen, young man, we want you to try something for us. And they did a stock scam, and they stole $5 million from Pathé Newsreel, which was a huge company in those days. And they did it in broad daylight and no one ever saw it. No one ever caught on to it, nothing. And they said, that's very clever. Now, here's what we really want you to do. And they formed a short sell aimed at 30 companies in Europe. <clears throat> and the short sell went for the first week. And, and it, you know what a short sell is? Dude? Right, uh, right. That's where you sell something uh, for less than what is owed on it. And you force a stock market to go a little crazy. Right. So, they did that, and the first week that it did went very well, and they made a lot of money, and they took a couple of days off. They were coming back, but then when they came back to do it the second time, the country was in a panic because the stock market was going up and down and over and out, and they did a rush on the banks, which caused the crash. Which now, caused the depression, right. That's correct. They didn't do that explicitly to do that wasn't done to, to primarily do that. It was done to aim at these people in Europe to slow them down with the fact that they, they wanted to bankrupt a few companies, you understand? Which right. they did. And one of the companies that they bankrupt belonged to Blackjack Bovier, who was Jackie Kennedy's father and his uncle and his father. And they were the bankers for the Rothschilds. And they all, and they never, you know, they had a hard time ever coming back from that. Well, they never they, did. He drank they himself never did. to death. Her father drank himself to death. And he was a good looking, handsome Hollywood type guy. And she never forgot that, this woman. And so, and, and she, it ends started, up marrying, she ends up marrying Joe. Another stockbroker guy. She married another guy in, in Wall Street and, and raised her family in the, in the way that she was accustomed to. But they, the, but what, what happened in the 20s, when, when after the crash happened, the president went to Joe Kennedy and said, wow, man, you did a really good job here, you know. Uh, we're going to make you ahead of the SEC now. And because they knew Europe had to reinvest in the country to get their money back. So they changed the rules of the SEC. And Joe Kennedy orchestrated all that. And when he got done that in 1935, they said, wow, you're really a pretty bright guy. You really did a hell of a job. This is pretty good. We're now going to make you ambassador to the UK. And you're now going to become ambassador to Joe Kennedy. And a couple other guys grabbed him who, who controlled him and said, listen, Sunshine, while you're in London, we want you to go and meet a few friends of ours because we want to orchestrate some stuff in Europe. And one of the first people she really got in bed with was the Shah of Iran, who was a gangster. And they put a bank together. And from that bank, they lent money to Hitler. And Joe Kennedy didn't think anything was wrong of it because he was, uh, the United States wasn't in the war. And the money they lent to Hitler came back 
to them to, and they add another guy, Khashoggi, and they bought arms off of them. So United Kingdom turned around to Joe Kennedy and said, whoa, pal, you're an ambassador for America. You're supporting the people we're at war with. You can't do that. And they threw him out of the country. Well, hey, Jack, I'm going to stop you right there. We're going to go to break, even though I really don't want to, but I really do need to play some ads. You are getting the long version of Jack O'Halloran. Moving to Clarksville, being stationed at Fort Campbell, or just moving to the Middle Tennessee, Southern Kentucky areas. Go see my friend Matt McWhirter in the mortgage division of FM Bank. Matt and FM are in the American dream business and they want to help your family achieve the American dream. They are located at 15 different Clarksville, Tennessee locations, or you can call Matt McWhirter at 931 245 4274. Reach out to Matt McWhirter on email at matt, M-A-T-T, dot M-C-W-H-I-R-T-E-R at myfmbank.com and ask him how you can apply for your home loan right online. Contact Matt McWhirter at FNM Bank for your home loan or refinancing needs at FNM Bank, member FDIC, and equal housing lender. Are you moving to either Tennessee or Kentucky? Well, then you need to know the hottest real estate agent in the Tuckasee markets is Felicia Long Grant for Keller Williams. Moving to either Tennessee or Kentucky, getting stationed at Fort Campbell, or being transferred to another base from Fort Campbell and need to sell your home, Felicia Long Grant aligns herself with champions and delivers excellence. Ask her about the hottest properties now available in the market at Wellington Fields and the soon-to-be Stonehurst development. Call Felicia Long at 931-206-4980. That's 931-206-4980. Felicia Long Grant for Keller Williams, aligning herself with champions and delivering excellence. From criminal defense to contracts, from divorce to child custody, from military law to asset forfeiture, At the law office of Kimberly Turner & Associates, we know that sometimes bad things happen to good people. Sometimes good people just get caught up in bad situations and need someone to navigate them through a frightening and daunting system. The law office of Kimberly Turner & Associates will stand beside you and guide you through your most trying ordeals. Call her office at 931-572-1134 or check out the full array of offered services by going to kturnerlaw.com. That's the law office of Kimberly Turner & Associates, 931-572-1134, because they are the law firm who cares. This is Fletcher Long telling you that we have all been behind the wheel after having had too much to drink. Some of us have seen the blue lights in the rear view. Others of us have been lucky. Who are you going to call when your luck runs out? Here's a hint. It better be the very best. If in that situation, the decision to me is clear, I am calling Attorney Lynn Morton. Competence, diligence, skill, and tenacity are 10 digits away. Call 931-320-2484 and ask for Lynn Morton. From divorce to DUI, from criminal defense to contract, one call does it all. 931-320-2480 gets you Lynn Morton. She'll get your ox out of the ditch and put your feet back on the street. Lynn Morton, 931-320-2484. Call her. There is nothing worse than being taken in a home buy. Should have had that property inspected and by someone with integrity who would do it thoroughly and correctly. Should have had Z-Best Inspection Services. Don't let this happen to you. Call Z-Best Inspection Services at 931-980-5759 and ask for Bud Wink. The home is the most expensive and important investment the American family makes in a lifetime. You really don't want anyone inspecting it other than Z-Best. That is Z-Best Inspection Services, 931-980-5759. Write this down. 931-980-5759.
Bud Wink is called the best inspection services because he is the best. The best inspection services changing the quality of home inspections one house at a time. What were you thinking? I only had a few drinks. And then drove home, really? Look, I'm sorry. Not as sorry as you're going to be. Okay, so now what? I guess we get you a lawyer. Great. You know how I feel about lawyers. Listen, Kelly's husband used Phil Giacino and Associates. She said he was fair, honest, and made sure that Jim had the legal representation he needed. I don't know. Listen, Kelly said Phil Giacino is an ex-Suffolk County assistant district attorney with over 24 years in practice. (laughs) Really? Practice? Couldn't get it right the first time? You're joking. Facing fines, losing your license, and even jail, and you're joking. You're right. What's Phil Giacino's number? Smart man. Let me look at my phone. Okay, 631-588-3155. Tell me again. 631-588-3155. Where's his office? 2780 Middle Country Road, Suite 208 in Lake Grove. Oh, right over by the Good Steer. Yes, great place for your last meal if you don't get Phil on the phone. Mistakes happen. When they do, you want an attorney you can trust. Philip J. Giacino is that attorney. Give Phil a call at 631-588-3155. That's 631-588-3155. Or check out his website at www.jacinolaw.com. What did Phil say? Told me not to worry. Got an appointment with him for tomorrow afternoon. Good. Now I'll get this little honey-do list for you. A little community service. Maybe I should call my lawyer. Still joking? Give me the list. start again with just my children and my wife thank my lucky stars to be living here today cause the flag still stands for freedom and they can't take that away There ain't no doubt I love this land God bless the USA Happy Veterans Day. You are back on the long version of Jack O'Halloran. Eric, happy Veterans Day to you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And Jack, happy Veterans Day to you. When when we went to break, we were discussing the fact that uh, Joe Joe Kennedy uh, had run afoul of the Purple Gang, had gone to Chicago for protection, had became property of the Chicago Syndicate. Um, they uh, he gets involved uh, in a short sale of some investments from Europe that ended up in a run on the banks that resulted in the Great Depression. Uh, ruins the Bouviers, uh, marries his son off to a Bouvier later. Son gets elected president of the United States, and Jack O'Halloran's at a party called Egyptian Nights the night before Kennedy is shot and uh, comes to learn uh, that it was an orchestrated takeout of Kennedy owing to the fact that the Kennedys had turned their back on two powerful entities that had helped get him elected and put him put President Kennedy in the position in which he found himself, that being the oil industry and the syndicate. Uh, and needed to get Johnson into the presidency before he was indicted for a shaky land deal in Arkansas. Did I get us caught back up? That's pretty good. <laughs> you got a good memory. <laughs> I guess being a lawyer, you know. Well, you know, I was, I was, a, I was a pretty fair country trial lawyer. Now, so uh, what you were talking about is you, you're looking at a gentleman who people would say, well, how could somebody be as cold as, as you're describing him? And you got to look at... He had a daughter who was uh, bipolar, and rather than have her embarrass him and his family in public, because she used to flip out, like a lot of people do today, they were on medication, and they didn't have those medications in those days, and they didn't have a description of bipolar, they were just mental cases, he had his daughter lobotomized. Being Joe, Joe Kennedy. 
had his Joe daughter. Kennedy yeah. had his daughter lobotomized. She just she she lived her whole life in an institution. Yeah. So when when four people went, you know, a lot of people when you talk about John Kennedy's death, and people say, well, you know, you look at the law division. Who was the top? Who was the top cop in the country? Everybody looks at Hoover. Who was the top cop in the country? Was the Attorney General? Who was Bobby Kennedy? Now, Bobby Kennedy went everywhere his brother went. He was his second skin, his whole political career. If you go back and recall history, yeah, right. Bobby Kennedy. Four people went to see him in his home before his brother went to Texas and begged him not to let his brother go to Texas. One of them being Adlai Stevenson. Adlai Stevenson was uh, was in Houston a week before Jack went to Texas, and they were spitting at him. He said, the animosity is diabolical. You do not want to send your brother to Texas. Okay? So saying that, and then the head of the Democratic Party and a few other people, saying that, you would think that Bobby Kennedy would go down and take a look at what's going on down there be, and be there when his brother was there to assure his safety. Bobby Kennedy never went to Texas before during or after Jack Kennedy was assassinated because he knew he wasn't coming home. His mm. father knew he wasn't coming home. Okay. And, and that's hard and cold to say, but when you sit down and look at it, so then you got to look back at the history, like we were just talking about how many people Joe Kennedy had angered, you know, and, and he did that through, what happened in England and they sent him home and he became ambassador to Kennedy. But in that whole period of time, he was making money from all the ships that were torpedoed and blown up and everything. Convoys going down to the war effort off of New York Harbor, which in incorporates the story of my father and everybody when they blew up the ship uh, in the Harbor of New York and blamed it on the Germans and how they got Charlie Luciano out of jail. Joe Kennedy was orchestrating building the ships back again. That's why Onassis hated him so much because he did it with another Greek out of Switzerland. And they, they were, so he was making money all the way across the board here. Yeah. Right. During his whole trial and tribulation and angered a lot of people. So what did they do to him? They didn't kill him. They didn't make a martyr out of him. What they did was they made him watch his sons die. His first son, Joe senior, who was the one he really wanted to be president, who was a really good young guy. Boy, everybody loved him. He had just gotten out of it. He was two weeks away from being out of the service. He was a famous pilot, World War II. And then they, there was a group in England that orchestrated this so-called airplane that was going to be like a kamikaze plane to fly into the German munition factories to put an end to the war. And they talked him into test piloting this plane. And he did. And the plane blew up and he died. And a week later, they scrapped the whole deal. First son well, did. Yeah, well, you know, the plane had served then its Jack purpose. Kennedy died. And then Bobby Kennedy died. And they disgraced Teddy Kennedy with the Chapepty thing. Yeah, with Chappaquiddick. Chappaquiddick. With the Chappaquiddick, yeah. yeah. And that girl died up there. And, 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 and Teddy could have saved her life. The car went into the water. Teddy was drunk. Instead of him walking a hundred feet to a, a hundred yards to a, to a fire station medic to get medical help for this girl before she drowned, he went home, took a shower, went to bed. Right. And they paid the girl's family off. You understand? Yeah. You know, that was disgraced. Yeah. Another Kennedy would never step across the threshold of the white house. And, 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 and when and when little John is running for Senate years later against Hillary Clinton, uh, his plane goes down. Well, he, that, that was another deal that was, uh, you know, one day we'll get into that and I'll explain that to you. you know, and, and that was another thing that happened that uh, unfortunately shouldn't have happened, but did happen. And the reason why it happened to him is because he was going to make a movie of his mother's diary. He okay. had his mother's diary and he was going to make a movie of it. And, and there was things in that diary that were no-nos. 
that that people just wanted, couldn't that people couldn't that couldn't learn. No way ever to be divulged, boy. You know, yeah. and and one of the things was, you know, when you see the assassination of Jack Kennedy, and you see her where she's looks like she's trying to crawl out of the back of the car. And they said, Oh no, she was trying to scoop his brains off of the back hood of the car is bullshit. She was trying to get out of the car because she thought they were going to kill her next. Yeah. She just watched Conley get shot. She just watched her husband get shot. There were 13 shots fired that day. And they did. And and she tried to get out of the car. And when they grabbed her, when the secret service guys grabbed her, if you ever watched the Zabruder footage, uh-huh. And you see the car possession going down the street. You'll see the Secret Service guys peel away from Kennedy's car. And they were at the car behind it when the shooting started. And they were running back up to the car. And they pushed her and they took her out of the car. And they made a deal with her on the spot. Keep your mouth shut and your children will be alive. If yeah. you talk, we'll kill your kids. You understand that? Yeah, I got it. So she kept her mouth shut. She knew exactly what went down. Except for in her diary. In her diary, she put a lot of stuff that was the truth. But people don't understand that the Kennedy relationship was already fractured. You understand? Yeah. She, was, I, yeah. she, she, she left a boat. She left a boat in Greece to be flown to Dallas. She was already on a boat with Anassis. She was pregnant with a, with a, with a kid who she lost. The, the son died. She lost the baby. Well, I think she, it's pretty well and documented. Month, and two months afterwards, two months after his death, Jack's death, she took up with Bobby. Well, I, I'll tell you this: it's pretty well documented that uh, uh, Senator, uh, that that President Kennedy and and Jackie Kennedy didn't have a very good marriage. I mean, that's it's all, it's I think, all documented. I think, yeah, I think history is pretty pretty clear. Everything I just told you is documented. Yeah. When you when you 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 go to go to the Kennedy assassination, it took them three months to reroute that routing down Dealey Plaza, and for him to be in an open car. And and the, and the Boyd the Bird Building the book depository which was owned by H L Hunt in actuality he funded the guy that, that owned it all the windows in the upper floors were wide open people walking around with the president in an open car down below would never happen right guys coming out of the train station walking over that bridge Woody Harrelson's father being one of them who was a lieutenant for Carlos Marcellus in New Orleans yeah and, and let me say this too uh, Woody Harrelson the famous actor. It is it is well documented that he's the son of of an organized criminal that uh, was involved in the rackets. I mean, all of that is very is worked very for well Charles Marcellus in New Orleans. Very very well documented about Woody Harrelson's father. I and, met his father. Yeah. I, I met his father. So anyway, he was one of the people come out of the train station. So there were thirty two potential assassins at Dealey Plaza that day. Okay. Right. And, 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 thir- and so 13. you're talking about you're talking about a, a guy named Zabruder who came from Russia as a white Russian. Yeah. And, 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 and his name was Abraham Zabruder. Correct. And then his and his partner was a guy named the Mornchild. And, J- and the Mornchild was engaged to Jackie Kennedy's aunt. And Jackie Kennedy called him Uncle George when she was a little girl. And they were funded by the garment district. Meyer Lansky gave them a quarter of a million dollar loan and sent them to Texas to open up the garment district in Texas. And Zabruder, who had never held a camera before in his life, stood there with two people holding his legs because he suffered from vertigo and never took his finger off the button of that camera with bullets bouncing all over the ground around them. Yeah. And the Zabruder film was already sold to Life Magazine for 150000 I think, before it was ever shot. You understand? Yeah. And that 28 seconds of movie that he took, because people say, well, how could, it all, how could people not have seen what was going on? How could you see it? It all happened within half a minute. Right. Gunfire came from several different places. 
And the guy that took the last shot that hit Kennedy at the top of his forehead and blew him backwards, and you see the back of his head come out, was the guy driving the car. And if you yeah, follow the car, the and, car slowed down and veered to the left to cut off the motorcycle guy. And then there was eleven. There was eleven frames, twelve frames missing from the footage because the footage was taken. The film was taken and processed in Dallas before it was sent to Chicago. And and I Jack, guess, I, I guess Jack, who owned the lab? Murchison. Hey Jack, let me cut you off for a second. We're we're gonna float this break, Eric. I'm just telling you, we're gonna float this break. Uh, but I wanted it, this is a good opportunity to say that on November 22nd, the anniversary of the uh, death of John F. Kennedy, we're, we're going to have a very special Kennedy show. And we will talk to people who are going to confirm what Jack just said, that there was a an entrance wound f- that from the front that blew out the back of the president's head. It had an exit uh, wound roughly the size of a human fist. So you, you if you please join us on November the 22nd. For a very special edition about the Kennedy assassination. So, so anyway, Jack, we, we I want to say really, really quick. Gonna, we, actually, we actually have someone that is coming on the show uh, that was 15 feet away from Kennedy when he got shot. He was an actual witness to the assassination. Uh, we have the gentleman he, he that saw the first. He yeah, we, saw the first shot that hit him in the throat. Then. Yep, absolutely. We have the we we have uh, the gentleman that leaked the Zapruder film on uh, Geraldo Rivera. And uh, we have one of the pathologists that was involved with uh, the actual second investigation, not the original Warren Commission when they started up again in the 70s, uh, who is holding photographs that have never been uh, never been seen or never been disclosed to the public because they're saying, as we were advised, uh, point blank, that if the public ever saw these photographs, there would be no question in their mind that the shot came from the front and not from the back because of the injury. There's an entrance wound to the front and a blast out the back of his head. So everything well, Jack is everything Jack is saying. First, the yeah. first the first place he got shot was in the throat, and he, both his hands went up. To both his hands went up and, and grabbed his throat, and then he fell forward and he got shot in the lower back, which no one ever talks about. He got shot in his lower back, and then he fell on top of Conley, and he was in between the seats. And when the driver turned and just shot him, you see him fly backwards. Absolutely. That was the and, third shot that hit him. And, and, and everybody's seen the fly backwards because that caused a lot of the well, controversy. Oh, yeah, positively. Because the shot, you... the shot couldn't have come from behind him from the sixth floor of the book repository and had his head recoil well, in the manner we all see in the Zapruder film. So Let's, to, let's talk about the sixth floor of the, of the bird filling, okay? First of all, first of all, what's his name? Uh, uh, Oswald wasn't even in the building at the time. There were three guys in that window that were seen by the prisoners across, right across eye level, across is is a jail. There were three men in the in the window, two of them Hispanic looking. And let's talk about the shot from from that building. You're talking about a a a, a, a mail order rifle, bolt action. Now. You talk to anybody who's ever handled a rifle sniper-wise in, in anywhere in the world. You cannot, if you're a sharpshooter and you're shooting a bullet a thousand yards or more, <clears throat> first of all, you have, to res- you have to take a minute to rest your heart because your pulse is in your finger. And you have to settle yourself before you take that shot. Okay? To take three shots in 28 seconds, bolt action, it never happened. Never would happen. Yeah. Uh, of any accuracy. Of any accuracy. Okay? So they did shoot the rifle off. It made the noise. It distracted everybody. But you had, again, people walking around in that building with the windows open, moving things around. Never, ever, none of that would have ever happened with the presidency of the United States being below that window building. Okay? But it did. Anybody who ever shot a rifle will tell you that that shot in the Dealey Plaza with the wind variance there, there was it was like a wind tunnel. Even the microphones on the police could not hear each other because it was like a wind dervish down there. So you have the wind, you have the trees, you have the signs, and the car is going as moving on a decline. 
So to rip off three shots from that, that never happened of any accuracy. Would never right. happen. Right. Okay. Even though Lee Harvey Oswald was, in fact, a trained uh, military sniper. I mean, he, Lee he Harvey was. Oswald, Lee, Harvey Oswald was, Lee Harvey Oswald was a military, was, was, a, was a trained rifleman, but he wasn't that great of a rifleman, right. number one. Number two, the guy, when they had the, the sequence that happened at the rifle range, where a guy was at the rifle range and he, and he shot the guy's target next to him and made a big hoopla, and the guy said, who the hell do you think you are? And he's, I'm Lee Harvey Oswald. That was a CIA guy that looked like the Oswald. Right. There were three people that looked like Oswald. There was also the time when Oswald was in Dallas. At, at, at This is all at the very same time. He was in Cuba and Dallas. I mean, New Orleans and, and Cuba at the same time when he got locked up. Yeah. When he got and locked up in New Orleans, he was... There was another guy posting as him in Cuba the very same time. And, and you know, Jack, I, I wanted to say, too, that I have seen somewhere an interview with a woman who worked at the book depository and that lit, for whom Lee Harvey Oswald had worked, who claimed that Lee Harvey Oswald was on the ground level when the shots rung out five feet. In he front was of leaving him. the building. He was, yeah. he was on his way because he had a walk. I mean, I had I said I said in my book, I depict all this. And, and I sent a, a writer to walk, to, to time it, to walk from the depository to where his house was and, and time how long it would take and, and to put the sequence in order, okay, which would have never happened. And Oswald, first of all, we were just talked about the Mornchild, who was Sabruder's partner, yeah? Yeah. The Mornchild was the one who introduced Lee Harvey Oswald to the Russian girl who taught Lee Harvey Oswald Russian, he was his handler. Lee Harvey Oswald thought he was like the guy from the, the three li I read, I read three lives. He worked for the Naval intelligence people in new Orleans. He was, he go into a bar and pose as a gay guy because there were gay guys in the service who went to a certain bar in new Orleans and he would get them talking and tape them. And they were okay. blackmailing people because it was so bad to be gay. You understand? Right. So he thought that he was this major spy. And they sent him, they hooked him up with that Russian girl whose father was KGB. <clears throat> and they sent him, he went off to Russia. And he talked all the time and they bugged the place, every place he lived, they bugged. And he always talked and talked and talked and talked and talked until they threw him out of Russia because he was a, he was he was he couldn't be trusted. He wanted to turn Russian. He wanted to be this international work both sides of the street guy. He was going to be this spy in Russia. So they threw him out of Russia, which meant he came home and he was a throwaway. But his mother, his mother slept with a lieutenant from the Carlos Marcellus family. That's how he got involved with all this bull. They picked him and chose him to be and the cops. And Carlos Marcellus was the uh, crime boss in New Orleans? That's correct. Okay. That's correct. And, it, and it, he was, the, they, in other words, all these people were used like puppets to orchestrate something that went on. Okay. And, and it was, they were all, so it made the conspiracy so, so plausible because nobody could point a finger at any one of those groups being totally responsible for that assassination. That's how clever it was. And then the Warren commission was the biggest joke of all. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, the Warren commission was taking was the chief by, justice it was written yeah. by the guys from Yale. That, that was nothing more than trotting out the chief justice of the United States Supreme court to give us a version that we would accept and give it the air of legitimacy because of whom was delivering it. Yeah. Guess who was, guess who wrote the Warren commission? Our inspector, all people from the skull and bones of Yale. The same society of which Prescott George w. Bush, Prescott Bush and little George Bush were all members. Absolutely. See, I'm catching, very, I'm, catch, which, I'm catching which, on here. <laughs> which is a very, very seriously politically and industrial group that holds a lot of power in industry. 
Okay. Yeah. Like the Masons. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about a lot of interweaving here. If you ever read the Warren Commission's 32 volumes, it's bullshit. The one bullet theory was sold to the American public and it was sold very, so well because the media, one more time, just like in our presidency just happened, the media got involved. And they put, did a thing on, 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 on television, the reenactment and all this bullshit. Well, I have the 11 original frames that were taken from that film. I have a copy of them. Yeah. Of the missing footage. That shows joke that shows the driver actually turn and shoot Kennedy, which is the part of the footage that some people have never seen. It was, I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was taken out of the footage. And then the, then the film went to life magazine and no one ever saw that film for a year. You realize that, right? I mean, there is so much about this assassination that is, that is shady that it, it's it's just about within the common vernacular within the vernacular of common knowledge that this assassination could not have been accomplished the way that the warren commission claimed no there's no way the one bullet theory was total nonsense yeah the magical bullet when they did the autopsy yeah. on joe kennedy when they did the autopsy on jack kennedy that was all done by interns they controlled everybody. They pulled the flap of skin down over his forehead when they took the picture. Mm -hmm. they, the whole thing was contrived. They rushed the body up north. The whole thing was contrived. So, you know, the saddest part of the whole deal is that it was a, it was a coup against the public. That, you know, here you go with one of the most devastating things in our era. And it was totally contrived. Which is sad. And people, well, if, and information is leaked out every 10 years. Something comes out, you know, something comes out. I waited to write my book because I wanted it to, to be leaked, in, and it did. It's because it's all there. And, and your book is Family Legacy. I want to pub it a little bit. You wrote a book entitled Family Legacy. Correct. Um, and tell everybody how they can get a copy of this book. Go right to Amazon. Just If you go to familylegacythenovel.com, FamilyLegacyTheNovel.com. It takes you right to a site, and it, and it which directs you right to Amazon, or just go to Amazon and ask for Family Legacy, and you can get a copy of the book right off of off of Amazon. Well, it's, well, uh, it, well, you know, it, it, it's one of a trilogy. I'm ready to put the other two books out now. Well, I I hope I, I hope that uh, uh, yeah. I mean, everybody should run out and get it. But I hate to leave this topic because it's just fascinating. But I want to talk. I cannot have Irish Jack O'Halloran on the show and not talk about his boxing career. I mean, that, that, that would be that would be such a disservice because you were uh, you were the California heavyweight champion for two years. You're in the California Boxing Hall of Fame. You're in the New Jersey Boxing Hall of Fame. You fought Kenny Norton for 15 rounds to a decision where you got ripped off uh, because you fought in his hometown. You fought George Foreman. Uh, at one time you were 16 and 0 and considered, uh, you know, maybe the top contender for the heavyweight title. You, uh, put Rahim Ali out of the boxing industry at the bequest of Muhammad Ali. Brother. So, <laughs> I mean, all of these things, you know, for one thing, I, I studied a lot about your body and, and you know what, you're one of the boxers on whom, uh, Rocky Balboa was based you and Chuck Wepner. Wepner that's correct. That's you true. and Chuck Wepner, uh, you did a movie called Farewell, My Lovely, which is one That's of your, which is your favorite movie in which you ever appeared. Yep. And you played, you see, I've done my homework. You see all the homework. <laughs> uh, you played, I, I think his name was, was it Muggsy? Moose Malloy. Moose, Moose Malloy. Moose Boy. You were Moose yeah. Malloy. Uh, yeah. A young Sylvester Stallone was in that movie. You starred in that movie yeah. with your mentor, Robert Mitchum. Oh, and yeah. Sylvester Stallone picked your brain morning Every after morning. Day. Every day. And Every and day. so and and now Chuck Wepner fought Muhammad Ali and he yeah, fought yeah. him he fought him much more valiantly than anyone believed he could. And so the part about Rocky that uh and he was a bleeder, just like Rocky bled all over the, the fight with Apollo Creed. Apollo Creed loosely based on Muhammad Ali. 
Uh, Rocky, that fight that occurred in the first fight, kind of a redo of the Webner Ali battle. But the Philly street tough ethnic, known by his ethnicity, fighter was Irish Jack O'Halloran, wasn't it? That's true. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, he. I mean, I explained a lot of things to him when he when he did when he was writing the script for that, and he. Uh, um, you got to understand, boxing to me was a day job. You know, I was. A, uh, you, you always had to have a day job, you know, when you were doing things in the street. And, uh, and and I was never attached to any one gang. That's the way I was educated and taught. Uh, I was I, I floated all over the place. I, I only listened to certain people, uh, Meyer being one of them, and uh, and Frank Costello before he died, and uh, and uh, and a man in Raymond Patriarca in New England, and uh, and Felix Picchio. And you know there were uh, there were certain people that I that I would totally listen to if I had if I had if a guy called Frankie Carbo was out of jail, uh, when I was boxing, I would have been probably the heavyweight champion of the world, uh, because I would have taken boxing serious. I had a talent. I was given God given talent that I kicked myself in the butt all the time because I abused the terrible. Uh, I, you know, <clears throat> when I started boxing, I, I left football and I couldn't box amateur. So I'm probably one of 10 people in the heavyweight division in the history of fighting that never boxed amateur and became a world ranked fighter. There's only yeah. like 10 of us. And so, you know, when I started out in, in boxing, I, uh, I quit football and I was very disenchanted when, the, when they sold the team to, uh, <clears throat> Jerry Wallman in Philadelphia, he hired a guy called Joe Q. Harrick to coach the Eagles. And, and I, I had already had an association with the jets up in New York and I, told Eubank I wanted to go down and play in Philly and because I had a lot of friends of mine there. And I watched a guy trade a championship football team away. It was unbelievable. And so I, I said, you know, Ali had just won the title. And I said to some friends of mine, I'll knock that sucker out. And they said, you know, that's a great idea. And they put me in the gym. And I went from 275 pounds of football muscle down to 226 pounds of boxing weight. And, uh, uh, conditioning and stuff and and started out extremely very well and uh but i still did never I, I never went to train in in training camps uh when i started boxing we got ten dollars a round for a fight um and you know i um i went through my career you know doing precarious things in, in the daytime and nighttime and going to the gym when I had the chance and trained a few days here, a few days there. And, uh, and it came down to uh, people wouldn't fight me because I was beating certain fighters at certain time. And, uh, yeah, and, and I want to, I want to explain something here. If you'll let me interject, Jack, uh, the fight game is pretty rigged. I mean, it, it, you know, I mean, it's, well, it's, yeah. it's, it's just controlled. It's, you know, it's, it's not when you say rigged. Uh, a lot of the fights weren't actually in the old days. They were more rigged than they are today. Today they're just what you call overmatched. Okay. Well, well, I'll tell I'll tell you something funny. I, I used to work for an old lawyer in Nashville uh, when I was yeah. a young lawyer, and I used to ask him. I'd say, uh, "Would you get my? Would you help me get this ticket fixed?" And he'd go, "Fletcher, fixed is an ugly term. That's we don't right. we don't use the word fixed. Handle. You, you need some fixed. you need some assistance. You know? Well, anyway." So so maybe so maybe uh, boxing uh, uh, having a lot of fix in the boxing is 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 not appropriate. Maybe I should say controlled. But so so I stand corrected. But I want to talk a little bit. You know, you had a bout coming up with Rahim Ali, and you you didn't know that this was. Well, moving. I was already in California. I mean, we can, the, what got me to California was I was uh, in New Jersey, and I was indicted for a few union problems we had. Uh, we owned the bartender waiters union in, in, in New Jersey from Atlantic city to, from Camden to Atlantic city. And we were indicted for several different things and, uh, for that and two other union deals. And they called me on the phone and said, do you want to fight Ken Norton? And I said, uh, when the guy said next week, I said, send me a ticket. The guy said, you'll take the fight. I said, absolutely. Send me a ticket. I wanted to get out of New Jersey. And so I took the fight and uh, on four, like a week's notice. And I trained four days and, and 
gave Norton a licking. I mean, it was a, it was probably one of the greatest heavyweight fights they've had in California in a long time. And, uh, if ever, and so people were standing on their chairs in the ninth round screaming so loud because Norton and I were going out in the middle of the ring. They rang the bell at the end of the round and had to ring it three times before anybody heard it. And the referee came and separated us. And I was going back to my corner and he ran across the ring and hit me behind the head and drove me into the corner post. And the commissioner jumped up in my corner and said, if you can't continue, you just won the fight on a foul. And I was so angry. I said, foul, I'll kill that son of a bitch. <laughs> I went out in the 10th round and said to myself, what am I doing here, man? And, and, and you ended up losing by decision. A, a, even, a split, even, a split even decision. Up, I lost a split up, decision. You know, so, I mean, that kind of shows. But who, I won the town. I stayed yeah. there. I never went home. Yeah. I won the city, and I stayed there, and I knocked out a few guys in a row, and that's when Rockman's fight came up. You know, I, I was having a good time in San Diego, and, and, and I get a phone call from a dear friend of mine who's in, in Las Vegas who was the closest – white man to Ali. His name was Gene Kilroy. And and I knew Gene Kilroy. He was an ex-CIA guy. He was, uh, in fact, all the Kennedy kids that were put into rehabs were put in under his name. And he was a publicist for the Philadelphia Eagles. And he became a very close consultant to Ali. And Ali loved him. And I mean, loved him. He went everywhere with Ali. And he was, Ali bought a home in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And he, I get a phone call from Kilroy and Ali. And Muhammad said to me, uh, listen, I want you to do me a favor. I said, I'll do you a favor. Sign a contract to fight me. And I'll do you any favor you want. And he said, no, I'm dead serious. You got to listen to me. And I said, okay. So he said, I need you to, you're fighting my brother and you got to get him out of boxing because, you know, he's, he's not me. You understand? And I said, Rockman Ali's your brother? <laughs> he said, yeah. So I said, oh, shit. And I said, okay, no problem. We'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. And he said, I promise you, you and I will fight. And I said, excellent. Good idea. So and I hung the phone up and I said, oh, my God, I better go to the gym because I had trained for this guy. I was sitting in a bar when they called me. So I, I, I went and I went, trained a couple of days and you know, fighting this kid. And I knocked him out in the ninth round and he never fought again. I mean, I hit him. I hurt him. Right. Well, I, I, I got to ask, you go to Miami and, and to fight Jimmy Somerville. And if you beat, yeah. if you beat Jimmy Somerville, you're going to fight Muhammad Ali. And you go down there and you lose. Well, that was it, actually, I was supposed to fight Ali when Norton fought him. Okay. That, that fight was mine. He, that was the promise he made to me. And I went to a promoter who owned the Coliseum. He was a Canadian guy who owned the arena in San Diego. And we had telegrams with Ali. We made him a great deal. It was one of the more lucrative deals that he ever had at that time. And uh, Norton was owned by two very wealthy men, Bob Byron and, and Art Rifkin. Art Rifkin owned Coca-Cola. Bob Byron owned La Jolla. Uh, very, very wealthy guy. And they took $3 million and went to Chicago and sat down with Herbert Muhammad. And, and Norton got the Ali fight. And Ali called me on the phone. He, 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 you know, he, he was crying. He said, I, I don't know how to tell you this. I really, I really have to tell you, it was take it, it's out of my hands. There's nothing I can do about it, Jack. He said, but I promise you, we'll find a place and a, and a venue and we'll, we'll make a fight with you. And I said, okay. So when he fought Bugner in Australia, he was supposed to fight me. But I screwed that up myself when I went to fight Somerville and the Dundees were going to handle, Dundee's son was going to handle my, my career. And I went to fight Somerville in Florida, and I, uh, I wasn't in the greatest shape. And, and Jimmy Somerville was a tough, tough kid. I mean, he was a tough kid. And uh, he's a guy, a guy you hit and hit and hit. And, you know, so I fought him the first time, and I lost the fight. And I was so mad at myself. <laughs> I said, uh, you know, they stopped the fight very quickly in the ninth round. So I... I said, okay. So I went right back two weeks later or three weeks later and fought him again. I just trained every day and I, I knocked him out. I beat him to a pulp. Yeah. You know, Jimmy ever fought after that. In fact, he said to me, it's the worst beating anyone's ever get. And he was a tough street kid. He was a really tough kid. He was a, and a nice guy. I like Jimmy. Jimmy was a good guy. Now, and, now, now, Jack, I got a question that listeners asked me to ask you yeah. in the spirit of veterans day. Do you have any opinion about 
Ali converting to Islam in order to not have to go to Vietnam? You know, that's a sad story because his brother, Rockman, was, was a Muslim. And that's how Muhammad got caught into the Muslim deal. And what the true story of that is, is that he was owned by a wealthy white group out of Louisville, Kentucky. They owned his original contract and they took very good care of him. He drove a really neat Cadillac and they, he was a great athlete, a great fighter. And they took good care of him, but they were lax on re-upping his contract. And when his contract came up again and they didn't, they didn't pick the, the they didn't pick the option up. Herbert Muhammad grabbed him and, and signed him to the contract. And he now was owned by the Muslims. And when that happened, the people in Louisville got very angry and they went into the draft board and they changed his draft status from what there used to be a draft status called 1Y, which meant that you which weren't eligible for draft. And he was 1Y and was trained over to 1A. And when the, the, the subject came up of, of him going in, the, in the, being drafted, he said, well, wow, man, you know, uh, I'll be like Joe Lewis. No, I'll just, I'm not, I won't leave the country. I'll be able to fight. We won't lose anything. I go and train. I'll teach fighter to soldiers how to be fighters. And, uh, and, and we can box like Lewis did, do the same thing. And they said, uh-uh, you go into service, we'll shoot you from behind, son. And they had just killed Malcolm X, which scared the death out of him. Right. And, uh, and then he became, he started getting really involved in the Muslim religion and, and they, they got him married off and all of a sudden, you know, and he, one thing after another. And, and, and I have, let me tell you something. I love Muhammad Ali. He was a, he was an amazing individual. He was so bright when you ever got to him one-on-one -on -one and had chats with him. We had a lot of talks, he and I, uh, he was just, he was an amazing individual. He was a, he was one of the, one of the, one of the premier athletes I ever met in my life. He, he would have been good in any sport he tried. He was just you, a pure athlete. You were quoted one time as saying that the fighters of today uh, would have been eight rounders in your day. That oh. nobody learns nobody learns their craft anymore. Nobody's really a fighter anymore. And that the greatest heavyweights sure. of the day wouldn't have been they they would have been very pedestrian. That there were a lot that Ali had to whip way better heavyweights. Oh my god! When I was when I was a ranked fighter, there were there were. 15 guys. You had Oscar Bonavina, you had Zora Foley, you had Cleveland Williams, you had, I mean, I can one after the other, you know, uh, fighters who were unbelievable, who would have been champs today. Okay. I mean, there was just a lot of fighters, a lot of heavyweights who could fight at that time. I fought in a real serious era of, uh, I mean, uh, of, I mean, I, I fought, when I fought Blue Lewis in Detroit, and Blue Lewis had just went 13 rounds with Ali in Ireland. And then he brought him home and he beat Ernie Terrell, who was another great fighter. And he beat another guy and they were getting ready to make a title fight again. So they called me up in California and uh, I had lost my license in California because of some organized crime thing they were trying to pin on me, which was a bunch of garbage. But they took my license away for a few months. And they called me up from Detroit and they said, would you fight Alvin Blue Lewis? Because he was supposed to fight Buster Mathis. And, and they couldn't get a license for Mathis in Michigan. So I said, can I get a license? And they said, absolutely. I said, I'll take the fight. They said, you'll take the fight? I said, absolutely. So I went to Detroit and I was about 10 pounds heavy, but I ran every day. I was always, I always kept myself in pretty good shape. I still do today. I can't run anymore. I wish I could. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so I, I go to Detroit and, uh, and, and, I, and I go to the gym and, uh, and the trainer, the famous trainer, oh God, his mind keeps slipping out of my head. He owned the Kronk gym and he trained, uh, uh, a lot of champions and he was, um, Anyway, so he was Blue Lewis's trainer. And they sent a guy over to the gym to watch me work out. And the guy comes over, and I skip rope for an hour. I hit a speed bag for an hour, and I boxed eight rounds with some people. And he goes back. He says, I think we got a problem. This guy's in great shape. So we go to the weigh-in, and Billy Jean King was there. They were making a big deal out of it because they're getting ready to make this guy another title fight. And beating me would have been a great peg for him. And the – Newspaper, I mean, the, the, the TV reporter guy sticks a mic under his face and says, well, Blue, what do you think about this guy you're fighting tonight? And the guy said, 
And he says, oh, he's just another tune-up. Tune-up. I grabbed the mic. I said, tune-up. I'll knock your ass from one end of this ring to the other. You're, you're mine, sonny boy. I'm going to whoop the shit out of you. They <laughs> shut the cameras off. And this guy's eyes got big as saucers. And, and I was in Detroit. There was a kid who was an Olympic gold medalist, Ronnie Harris. God bless him. He's, he's not alive today. He was Hedgeman Lewis's partner. He ran the streets, the black area of Detroit. He ran Jefferson Boulevard. And he and I were dear friends. And he was a tough, tough little monkey. And I said to him, listen to me, Ronnie. You bet every single round of this fight. He said, Jack, you're fighting in Detroit against the number two ranked heavyweight in the world. And it's his city. I said, bet every single round I'm going to beat this guy to a pulp. And I did. I beat him 10 out of 10. I beat him so bad in the seventh round, he begged me to knock him out. I stopped hitting him in the head after the seventh round. I just broke his body. I broke his ribs. I broke his eye. I beat him up terrible. It was a terrible. He took a, I don't think he ever really fought again. After and, and, and who does that sound like, movie fans? That sounds like Rocky Balboa. Doesn't, <laughs> it? Doesn't it? it? Really? The shots to the body, breaking his ribs, oh, just oh like in, God. They, huh? they wouldn't fight me. They, and then no one would fight me. And they, you know, it was a, it was, a, it was a joke. It was, it was just, you know, it was. I did the same thing when I knocked out a guy called Manuel Ramos, who was the number one ranked heavyweight, number in, one ranked heavyweight in the world. That's right. And he was undefeated, and uh, and and they, it was 1968, and I, um, they took me off to. I took a fight in South Africa and I went down there for a month and I trained and, and I got in great shape and I fought in South Africa and 11 days later, I fought Manuel Ramos in LA. So I flew back from, uh, from South Africa to my home in Jersey, got on a plane and went to Los Angeles and George Fernandez said to me, you're in shape. I said, well, aren't you supposed to be in shape when you come to fight or what? What's the deal? I said, not only that, I'm going to knock this guy out. You can't do that. He said, they were getting ready to make a title fight with him, with Ali. And I, he said, you can't do that. I said, what do you mean I can't do it? I'm going to knock him out. What can I tell you? And I did. And I let, me ask, out. let me ask you this question, Jack. You, you know, out of your, you know, you fought, I think your record says you fought 57 professional fights. You may have fought I actually more. fought 70. I had 20 smoker fights, 25 smoker fights in New England. All right. 25 knockouts, actually. Let me ask you this question. Let me ask you this question. How many times did you lose a split decision that your thought was, I, there's no way I lost this fight? Oh, my God. Several. I mean, probably maybe, maybe 10 or 12. I mean, I fought Ron Standard in Omaha, Nebraska. I took the fight on two days. I gave him the worst beating. And Ronnie is a good friend of mine. He's alive today. I gave him a terrible beating. He didn't even know where he was at the 10th round. And they stole the decision away. And he fought Frazier after that. I mean, I so, beat him terrible, man. And, you know, so I, 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 there's, you know, that, but that, I didn't really care. I was, it, it was, gave me a, a reason to do certain other things. It put me in areas that I could take care of other business while I was there, you know. My mind wasn't, and I suffered from a disease called acromeglia, which I should have never been in the ring in the first place. Acromeglia uh, is a tumor of the pituitary gland. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, called giant. You, you produce way more growth hormone than that's what correct. People generally. Yeah, and it, and, and it causes I, depression and it causes all kinds of shit. And you know, I, I hate to gloss over your acting career because as a character actor, you were pretty top drawer. Um, you turned down the role of Jaws in Moonraker. I turned down the role of the, white, of the Great White Hope. And I was about to say, I was, about, that was I was about after to say I knocked that. out I knocked out Manuel Ramos and, and Steve McQueen wanted you to play the role in the Great White Hope, you turned that down. Well if, you, if, you, if, if you'd have taken if you'd have taken Jaws in Moonraker, you probably yeah. end up also in Pale Rider with Clint Eastwood. Well I was offered that, yeah. I was in fact that. Richard Keel five the, pictures I turned down, he did them all. He did them all. That that became the rumor in Hollywood that Richard Keel uh, made an entire career off of Jack O'Halloran's uh, uh, turndowns. That's you turn true. you turn down an opportunity to be interviewed by Johnny Carson that had been arranged for you by Robert Mitchum. Mitchum tells you, go on Carson's Tonight Show, you'll win an Academy Award. And oh, Carson told me himself. I would have got a supporting actor that year. That's correct. For, for King Kong? For uh, No, for Farewell. Farewell, my lovely. 
uh, that's just fair, that's a great that's farewell, a great film. Great farewell, film. my lovely. When farewell, my lovely came out, and uh, you know, uh, I I really Mitchum and I were. He was like a father to me. He was great, and he he put together this meeting with Johnny Carson, and he said, "I, I want you to go to the Polo Lounge and sit down with him. And if you go on his show, he'll get you nominated." And I said, "Okay." So I go and I meet him, and, and with him was Ed McMahon. This is a funny story. He's with him is Ed McMahon. And Ed McMahon was a, um, like a, a, a general in the reserve army. He was a pretty high ranking guy. And yeah. we used to buy war surplus from him in Philadelphia. We would buy tanks and shit and stuff and sell it to other countries. And, uh, and he, <laughs> when I walked in to meet Johnny Carson, he didn't want Carson to know that I knew him. Now I remember Ed McMahon when he was, uh, when he was, uh, Dick, Dick Clark's sidekick on American Bandstand before yeah. he went up to New York and, and got on the Carson show. Uh, so it, anyway, he, so I sit down with Johnny Carson and, and he said to me, boy, we're really looking forward to you doing the show. Farewell, my love. He's such a great movie. Mitchum thinks so highly of you. Da, 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 all this blah, blah, blah. He said, and uh, I, we really want you to do, do the show and I, I'll get you nominated if you do my show. And I sat there and I thought about it and I said, at that time, his show was live, wasn't taped. And I said, um, I don't think I could do your show. He said, why? What are you talking about? He said, this is all set up. You're going to come on the show. I said, yeah. I said, but, you know, you're going to, I'm going to come on your show and you're going to ask me about my father and I'm going to ask you where the men's room's at. He said, you would get up and leave? I said, Absolutely. He said, well, 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 we won't, then we won't do that. We'll give you a list of questions of what we'll ask you. Uh, and, and, and I said, wait a minute, you know, you're the number one action reporter in the country and you have Albert Anastasia's son on your stage and nobody talks about my father and you're not going to ask me questions about him. I said, what do I look like? A fellow for turn of truck. I appreciate the offer. You're a wonderful man. Robert thinks very highly of you. But I, I don't believe I can do this. Thank you very much. And I left. Mitchum grabbed me the next day. He said, are you out of your mind? He said, this is Hollywood. Who cares? What's the matter with you? But I just, I was still, I was just off the streets. You understand? I was still yeah. in the streets, actually. And I went to Hollywood, you know, to, and a lot of people wanted me to go to Hollywood. They wanted me to do the Great White Hope. They wanted to get me off the streets then. And, you know, they were trying to always protect me. You understand? The Great White Hope movie was all set up. Eddie, Eddie, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, oh, God. The, Eddie the, the third. He was his father, the family, all in the, uh, Eddie Foy. Eddie Foy the third. He put the deal together with Raymond Patriarchus, sent some people out to make sure that I did this movie. And it was all set up. All I had to do was walk in and sit down with the producer and sign a contract. The deal was done. And Gambino's nephew was to be my agent, and uh, Mushi Calhoun, who was the uh, the boxing uh, guy who was doing all the fight scenes, uh, it was all collusion. But it, this this movie was mine. And the guy said to me, "Well, this is great opportunity for you. We're going to take you to Spain for six months, and we're going to give you I don't know fifteen hundred a week, and uh, and you're going to you know we're really looking forward to you doing this movie." And I said, uh, "Hold on a minute. You're going to give me what?" He said, we're going to give you 1500 a week. I said, son, I give that away in tips. Number one. Number two, I just knocked out the heavyweight ranking <laughs> heavyweight in the world. You're asking me to give up boxing and go to do a movie? I don't think this is the right idea for me. I said, you know, I said there's, a, there's a guy who just retired. His name is Jim Beatty, big, tall, white boy out of <clears throat> Minnesota. And he's got six miles to feed. Here's his phone number. Give him a call. I'm sure he'd love to do the job. And he'd do a good job for you. But I really appreciate the offer. Thank you. For, and the guy was flustered. He said, well, wait a minute. This was all set up. What, what, what are you talking about? You're supposed to do this movie. And I got up and walked out. And 84 was standing on the other side of the board. He was sweating bullets. He said, looked at me. He said, you're going to get us killed. What are you doing? You're supposed to go and do this movie. And I said, yeah, don't worry about it. I'll take care of the East Coast. Don't, don't worry about a thing. It's no problem. Hey, and Jack. Let me, that, uh, hey, Jack. Let me talk to Eric for a second. Eric. Yes, are sir. You, you, I'm here. 
I'm here enjoying. I'm enjoying. Listen, I I love the I love listening to Jack. He's so great. He really I, is. I'm not I'm not ready to go off air. Is there any chance you would give us some bonus coverage? We, yes, absolutely. You can feel we, free. We actually have uh, Matilda Como, the governor's mother, uh, and Mario's uh, wife, now deceased, of course, Mario Como, coming in for one o'clock. So you got about another thirty minutes if you want to take it. Feel free. I won't. I, yeah, if you, who, if, who if am you I don't to, mind. Who am, don't I, mind. who am I to interrupt the uh, the amazing Jack O'Halloran? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jack, can you do me a favor? Can you do me a favor? Yeah, sure. Uh, hey, uh, I got to tell you, in my studio right now, hey, guys, turn around for a second. Uh, Mar- I have Martin. Martin and Ethan, they are, uh, they are s- seven years old. And Martin, they're best friends here. They're buddies. They're big Superman fans. And uh, they know all about you. And they're sitting here listening, uh, waiting. And if you could just say hi to uh, Martin and Ethan, that would mean a lot to them if you could. Hey, Martin, Ethan, how are you guys doing today? You, you, got, you know what, guys? Uh, uh, Fletcher, can I take just one minute here? Guys, come in here for a second. Come here. Yeah, do it. Do come it. here. Come yeah, here one it. second. These are, these are, these are the, the future of America here, and they, they know about you guys. So let's just say, say, hi, to, say hi to Mr. O'Halloran. Hi. Mr. O'Halloran. Hi, how are you doing, Mr. fellas? O'Halloran. All right, and say hi. Say hi. Uh, just call me hi, Jack. Mr. Say hi, Jack. Just call me Jack. Say hi, Jack. Hi, Jack. You, right. <laughs> you, guys, having, you guys having a good day? They're having a, are you having a good day, Ethan? Yes. Yeah. What are you doing? What are you doing right now? Eating donuts. Eating donuts. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, go back eating your donuts. Thanks, Fletch. I just wanted to take the time to let them say hello really quick. Yeah. So take another thirty, Fletch. Go ahead. Do it. Yeah. Right. That, 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 yeah. Let me. You know, let me. Uh, I just got to see. Jack. I just want to see one thing here. I have, and also you got to say, Jack. You know what you can do for me? One other favor. I got. Uh, I got my boss standing behind me. Say hi, boss. Hi, Jack. I've been listening at home. Really great interview. Things that I didn't really understand or know. I really appreciate you. That's Linda, Jack. That's Linda. Hi, how are you? How are you? <laughs> All right. Nice to meet you. Do you know what we're gonna have to do, Jack? Linda, do we have enough time on the tape here? Do we need yeah, to just restart? No. Are we good? We're good for. East, I know. We got another. Okay, we're good. Yeah, Fletch, take another thirty. You got it. All right. All right, I, I, you know, Jack, I've got to get to your part as non in the Superman okay. series. Okay, uh, yeah, I, we can do that quickly. Let yeah. me let let me kind of set this up, okay? Yeah. Now, you, you played a mute in a movie with Chuck uh, Norris, so no, you t- I, play, I played a, a mute in the. Oh yeah, I did. Well, yeah, the guy was like a mute. You're right. Yeah, yeah, hero, hero in the, the terror. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. So, so you come up with an idea. You've got three villains that are going to be Kryptonians. Terrence Stamp is playing a menacing guy. Sarah Douglas, you have described her as a man, female, very menacing. Um, and you wanted non to relate to children. And so it was actually your idea. To well, Donna make- and I, Donna and I talked about it. He asked me if I, what, how I felt about, uh, because the guy was lobotomized, supposedly he was, he was actually a genius. Non, he was a, a scientist. Mm-hmm. And he said, how do you feel about playing a guy who, uh, if he doesn't talk. And I said, let me tell you something. I would love to do the role because Jackie Gleason did a picture called Gigo and he won an Oscar for it. And he played a deaf, dumb mute and he did it with facial expressions and body language. And I said, boy, if I could ever get the chance and I did it with here in the terror, which was after the Superman movies. But right. I said, if I ever get a chance to do that, I'm going to grab it. You know, I want to do a character like that. And Nan was perfect because, you know, Terrence was a vicious general. Sarah was a vicious man eater. And somebody had to relate to the children because it's a children's movie. Yeah. Right. Right. And, Superman. And, right. So yeah. I, I played this character uh, with a child mannerism, this big brutish guy, but with this child mannerism about him, you know. And, uh, and we pulled it off quite well. It actually worked pretty well. You know, I've had a lot of people through the years say, my God, when I was a kid, you scared to death. Out of me. But I loved your character because I related to children, learning how to work my eyes and, and you know, doing childlike mannerisms with turns. And, uh, you know, and, and it worked out very well. You know, it's just uh, and Donner gave me the la- let me do it. Let me get into it and do it, you know. Uh, and it worked good. Boy, it really, it really did. And then when I did here in the terror, I played this, this, this gorilla mute guy, like, you know, uh, this, this real treacherous individual. And, uh, and that worked out very well as well. So. Now, I want to say this, uh, Christopher Reeves, particularly in Superman, his, the Clark Kent, his Superman persona on air persona was, a uh, very, uh, uh, very want wholesome, a uh, wonderful guy. You didn't find him particularly 
to be the well, same. Yeah, you gotta, let, let, me just say, let, let me let me explain something. First of all, there will never be another Superman like Christopher. Christopher played the role to the T. I mean, he was a great Clark Kent and he was a great Superman. And when he came on the set, he was like 170 pounds. And and uh, and the guy uh, that played Darth Vader uh, was a was a weightlifter and a bodybuilder. And and he and I and they were going to they were first going to bulk him up. And I said to him, "That's insanity. Don't do that." I said, "You know, we build him up like 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 George Reeves when when George Reeves won Mr. America. He was cut so well, but he only weighed like 190 pounds." Right. You know, he got big when he did movies. They build him up to make him look huge, but. When he won Mr. America, he was perfectly built. I said, take Christopher, because he didn't want to wear any things underneath of his costume that made him look muscular and stuff. He wanted he was he very much into playing Superman and, and wanted to have this natural bump. So I said to him, build him like a bodybuilder. Just, you know, really put definition in his body. And they put about 24, almost 30 pounds on him that way. And it worked out very well, you know, and he had the, an amazing look. He had a great look as Clark Kent, and he had a great look. He really did the character well. But he was a 26-year-old guy with a 16-year-old brain, okay? He was a Juilliard graduate. His mother is one of the wealthiest women in, South Jer- in, Jer- in the New Jersey state. Um, you know, he was a very privileged child. And, and prior to Superman, he had never really done anything. He did a soap opera and he, and he did a play with Catherine Hepburn where he held a spear, you know? So mm-hmm. he really got into the character of Superman uh, on and off the stage. Yeah. And, uh, and he was, you know, he, 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 I used to laugh. I say, you know, why you, you take life too serious, kid? Oh, blah, 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 you know? So he and I didn't really get on too well. Then he did something very stupid. He, he, I, I set everybody up. There was a friend of mine that had a restaurant in town, which is one of the paparazzi places in London today, uh, the San Lorenzo restaurant, a beach and place. And, and the restaurant was very small when we were doing Superman. It was just starting to grow. And Lorenzo and Mara were super people. And Meyer used to eat there. And so did the Cellini family and uh, a lot of dear friends. And, he, and they, were, they were Italians. And it was the first prominent Italian restaurant in London. And, and the guy was a unique guy that owned it because he didn't take credit cards. Everything was cash, mm-hmm. even up in the paparazzi days. You understand? So I brought everybody from Pinewood there to eat dinner and, and give them business and stuff. And, and they were all in there eating dinner one night, uh, the whole crew, except myself. I used to by myself all the time. Uh, friends of mine would come and join me, so the craze and some other people from London. Oh, the craze. The craze. Wait a minute. You're throwing out a name there. I want <laughs> to understand that Rodney and Reginald Cray were, oh, they were great huge kids. They London were, oh, gangsters yeah. and reputed. They were, they were East End Village. Yeah. yeah was they, a, they were a friend bad. of mine, David Barry. David one Barry of, was. One of them was boy. gay. It reputed. Ronnie. Me. And Ronnie. Ronnie, the fact that he was gay and, and his own self um, loathing for being gay made him almost intrinsically more cruel than, oh, yeah. than even his brother. Oh, he was Ronnie. Ronnie was a, Ronnie, Ronnie was a maniac. He but was, I, I, I mean, liked, I liked I, Ronnie. Ronnie and I, I got on very craze. well. The craze would beat you down, brother. I mean, they, oh, they, 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 they ran London with an iron fist. They, they you had, you had the Cray twins, the Richardson family in South London with Joey yeah. Pyle. Uh, Dave Barry ran Bayswater. Uh, and the Nash family ran North London. Uh, they were all, and all dear friends of mine. They were good people because we were involved in the, in the casino the, with the Cellinis and uh, when, they, when they put the Colony Club over there when George Raff was the host. And they closed it down because they didn't want to organize crime from the America into, in London. It was a joke. I mean, it was unbelievable. But, they had a lot of organized crime in London. Oh, please. Yeah. <laughs> But the, and it was a better city when they ran it, like like a lot of cities in our country, like Las Vegas, like all all the cities. You know, the right. when my father heard, like I don't know, you were where were you raised at? Hopkinsville, Kentucky. Okay, well, yeah, that's right. You and I talked about that, but yeah. but you never locked your front doors. No, you didn't have no. drive-by shootings in your neighborhood, and there were no. gangsters in in Kentucky. 
I knew some guys in oh, Louisville. Oh, 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 as a matter of fact, from Hopkinsville, we made Golden Pond Moonshine. There you go, son. And, and, and that, was, that was sold in uh, uh, Al Capone speakeasies. So there yeah. was a connection between Hopkinsville and Chicago. Absolutely. Bootlegging for big time. Yes, big sir. Time out of Louisville and then a few other places there I could tell you about. And then, and then he had the snake charmers there, boy. Those guys, you never played with them woods people, boy. They, 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 had, they had venoms that, would, that weren't even invented yet. Yeah. They wanted to bump your ass off, boy. They, they knew how to do it. But anyway, so we get, you know, you, you're talking about an era that, you know, things were, Christopher was, was a naive kid. And, and he did, went to this restaurant and he's talking about, my father and me and, and my gangster background and everything. And, and this guy called me on the phone. He said, Jack, he said, how well do you know this kid, Christopher Reeve? And I said, well, uh, just working with him. What are you talking about? He said, well, he's in here talking a lot of stuff about your father in New York and, and your organized crime connections. I said, are you serious? He said, what am I calling you for? So the next day I saw him on the set and I said to him, uh, Christopher, we need to have a chat. And I took him in a room, the two of us. And I said to him, you know, uh, how well do you know me? He said, well, you know, we work together. I said, well, what gives you the right to go in? And I really played into him. And I said, let me tell you something. You ever mention my name again, you put Mr. in front of it. If I ever hear another story about you talking about my father or something, you won't be finished in any picture, sunshine. Understand what I'm telling you. And he turned white, man. And then we went back out in the hallway, and all of a sudden he became Superman again. You know, yeah. hey, talk to me that way. Who do you think you are? And I said, what the? You know, and, I, and I grabbed him, man. I threw him against the wall, and I had him, <laughs> had him by the throat, and I was getting ready to whack the shit out of him. And Richard Donner came up and grabbed my arm and said, whispered in my ear, he said, not in the face, Jack, not in the face, please. Yeah, because we're trying to shoot something here. We can't. <laughs> and I we, laughed. I so we, we're not going to have enough makeup to cover this. Yeah. I just dropped the kid on the floor and I said, oh, my God. And I said, you don't know how lucky you are. And I walked away. I just, uh, but, I, I, you know, I never really got on with him because he was, he was like a child, man. He was, I mean, that's how he got, we used to go to a club in, in, uh, in, in London and uh, he, uh, Ringo Starr's first wife. She bounced them off the ceilings. You know, they, they were so naive, even around women and all. And, they, and his first wife is, you know, uh, there's a lot of stuff. Christopher, but he was a nice, he became a better person when he got hurt. Well, let when me, he got let hurt, me, he really became more humanitarian. I, I want to mention this because, you know, Marlon Brando had a role in, in, in the Superman franchise. And you and he became very good friends. Oh, Brando was terrific. Brando was great. Never been a better actor in your estimation? Oh, my God. Well, he and Mitchum and a few other people were, you know, Brando was a brilliant actor. He was, Brando was in a class of his own, uh, but he came from an old school era like Mitchum, like Gregory Peck. But Brando just had, the, Brando had this presence about him that was, that was eerie, man. I mean, you know, when he walked on a set, you could hear a pin drop. And, and he was, he's a New York guy and he, he knew my father, he knew about him and he, and he, he couldn't wait to meet me. And we became very good friends actually. Marlon was a good guy. I liked Marlon a lot. And he taught me a lot, the same as Mitchum did. You know, Marlon was, uh, he was such a brilliant actor. I mean, he, I, we were sitting on a set one day and I was up watching him work and he did a scene and something malfunctioned in the camera. And I never saw an actor do this before, ever get away with it. And instead of stopping and revamping and going around, he just, he just turned around. He said, get that thing working. And he turned around and then he turned right back into the shot and he had cue cards everywhere. I mean, they were everywhere. And he came down off the set and I said to him, what is with the cue cards, man? I said, I guess there's some people who'd be afraid to ask you that, but the hell with it. What, what is with you and these cue cards? Well, Jack, he said, you know, uh, I just don't want the camera to look like I, I've memorized line. I want it to look like I took them out of the air. I said, Marlon, I said, you're so full of shit. I said, what, what's the deal? No, no. He said, I started with beauty and the bounty and all this stuff. And, and then he started laughing and he, and he sat there and he ripped off a couple parables of Shakespeare. He's a great Shakespearean actor. And he ripped off a couple parables of Shakespeare. And he said to me, 
That you must know word for word. This stuff, piece of cake. <laughs> when he played, when he played the Godfather, did yeah. he talk to you a lot about how to play or approach that role? Not he. You know, he did the Godfather. He knew a lot of people. You know, and he was around a lot of people. And <clears throat> my father was one of the people that he took him. Uh, it, the Godfather was like four different Dons rolled into one. And in the in the era where where when the guy comes to approach him about the drug business, mm -hmm. and he said to the guy, you know, we can't do that because if we touch it, our children will touch it. It'll be the downfall of our families. My father said that. That's why my father was was killed because he wouldn't let them bring the drugs in through New York through the harbors. Okay. And they. Uh, and Genovese wanted the business because he had set it up when he was deported in, in Sicily. And, they, and they, they, they had this whole thing set up for bringing heroin into America. And my father was against it. He said, you know, that, we didn't sign up for that business. That's, that's Pabanya. We don't, we don't, that's not our deal. And the night before, and he knew six months before he died that he was going to die. He divested himself of all of his companies in Brooklyn. He sold the house to Buddy Hackett. Importantly, he, his wife, Elsie, and the kids uh, had already transported, set up to go back to Canada, where she was from. Uh, you know, he, uh, the, the night before at the Sheraton Hotel, Carlos Marcellus and Trafconti met him and begged him. They said, Albert, it's only business. Please look at what you're doing here. He said, I didn't sign up for this game. This isn't, uh, it was like Louis Lipke saying, take me and put me in the chair. This wasn't what, you know, he said, this isn't what we signed up for to do this. This isn't, this is a dirty business and it's not, not on my watch. I'm not doing it. And he got killed the next day. You know, uh, and it was all Gambino, 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 Genovese talked Gambino. Gambino was my father's underboss. Mm-hmm. My father was the head of the Gambino family. He was, it was before it was the Gambino family, it was his family. And uh, Gambino was his underboss and, they, and he was a treacherous little guy. And, you know, they, they conspired. And then Meyer Lansky told me afterward, he said, it was the worst mistake they ever made because when Albert died, was, he was the glue. After he died, the Appalachian thing happened that Genovese set up and they all got caught running through the woods in Pennsylvania and it gave the FBI a reason to expose everything and television was in play and the Kennedy family was already there. Bobby was on the commission for the Kiefer commission and they already were doing things to, you know, when, when, when Jack Kennedy, when Jack Kennedy, and that was in 57. And when, when it came up to the election and, and Jack Kennedy and stuff, you know, uh, as soon as he became president and they, they, when, when in the organization of making him president, they said, well, what are you going to do with Bobby? And they said, oh, well, we're going to make him attorney general. We're going to make him uh, uh, ambassador to Ireland. They told Lansky that. And mm -hmm. it was not true. He made him attorney general. And as soon as his brother made him attorney general, his father said to him, put all my good friends in jail. And they started to embark on, G on Giancana and a lot of people that put Jack Kennedy in the White House. Did what Joe... Did Joe, did, let, let me ask this question. Did Joe Kennedy, did he, did, had he gotten too big for his britches? Did he think that because his son was president that he oh, was yeah. untouched now? Oh my God, you couldn't touch him. Yeah. Because, because he signed his, he signed the death warrant of his family. If oh, he, absolutely. In fact, I'm, if you, if you look up, if you look through the, the, the journals of, of Kennedy, Joe Kennedy, the only building he ever really put it out of his own pocket money is the, is the uh, the building downtown Chicago, the Mercantile Building? They made him build that. Well, let, let me ask you this question: You worked with Gene Hackman and Terrence Hill uh, uh, in a movie called March, March or Die, Die. And, yeah. and, and 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 since it's Veterans Day, I thought I'd bring it up. Now, Gene Hackman, you said that the real headliner of this may have been Terrence Hill. He was the draw, even though he wasn't really that good of an actor, according to you. Well, you stand was, by those comments. Was, he was he was he was a, uh, uh, a an Italian. Uh, he was like a, a, a gunslinger that slapped you first. Drew him and Bud Spencer. They were a team, and they did a lot of these spaghetti westerns, and they were very popular. 
big time. I mean, he was a he was a blonde hair, blue eyed, northern Italian kid, uh, and he had a great look. And 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 the the movies were almost comedic like, but they were great drawing power. And he had a huge name in the cinema. And when uh, Lou Grade put that movie together, and they got Terrence Hill to uh, to do the film. Uh, they got an advance of like $8 million automatically out of Germany. Did they and, cast you because you looked like Bud Spencer or reminded people of Bud Spencer? Is that how no, you got cast in that film? No, 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 no. They, uh, they casted me because uh, they, um, uh, the, the director of the movie was the director of Farewell, My Lovely. Well, he wasn't a director. He was a producer, Jerry Bruckheimer. Mm -hmm. And they was the same crew that did Farewell, My Lovely. It was Lou Grade who did March or Die. And, and I, because of Farewell, My Lovely, I got the, the, the role. And I, and, I, and I really, that's when they offered me the role of Jaws. I could have turned down March or Die and went and did the, the Bond movie. They came, Cubby Broccoli came to see me in my agent's office in L.A., uh, to do Jaws, and I and I I turned them down, but I said I'm already signed to do a picture. That's the excuse I used, you know. And I could have got out of doing March or Die, and I could have went and done Jaws. But uh, from March or Die, I went and did Superman, which I much, you know, which 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 a much better move. But I, you know, I could have done probably both. Uh, <clears throat> I did that. There were several pictures that I, you know, uh, I did. There was a Gene Wilder picture. And with 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 uh, Richard Pryor, uh, Silver Street, that I was in the middle of King Kong, and I had a break while they went to New York to shoot the New York scenes, which we weren't in because we died on the log. Uh, but they didn't shoot the log scene till the very last thing in King Kong. So I was sitting in L.A. for like six weeks waiting for them to finish in New York, and I could have went to Seattle and done Mar Silver Street. And Paramount wanted me to do the picture so badly. I mean, they offered me the son, and I just turned him down. And Richard Keel did the role. You know, that was, uh, was another. Uh, again, again, another. Uh, yeah. You know, and you have to feel somewhat gratified that you helped his career as much as you did because he was a fantastic guy. Richard. Oh, Keel. he's a good guy. Richard was an. I mean, Richard and I have met Richard several times, and he also suffered from acromegaly. It killed him. He suffered from acromegaly, and that's now, what killed him. Now, now, March or Die was the first film in which Terrence Hill appeared and spoke English. Do you think that the uh, that the fact that he was not speaking his native tongue in the in this movie impacted his acting, or well, or was, you know, he 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 had it. Terrence was a funny kid. You know, he I remember I gave you a fast deal. We did a, a scene on the boat when he gets caught by Hackman when he, when he, with Catherine Deneuve. Mm -hmm. And and Hackman catches him and he makes him drink one drink after the other. Yeah. And and Terrence insisted that they put real booze in it so that he could get the feeling. And and I say, wow, man, th th does this guy know they're going to do like 20 takes? And he wound up puking all over Hackman. Oh, my God. Gene was so disgusted. He said, get this amateur out of here you know he was uh but he he was he was he wanted to be a method actor and he wanted to so much to do certain things and he got away with it doing the spaghetti westerns but uh when it came to doing uh pictures in america he never flourished like he thought he was going to do he married a school teacher up in massachusetts he was a nice guy terrence was a nice guy but he was he was a bit of a hypocrite in a lot of things. Like he, he would smoke, but he wouldn't let anybody know he was smoking. He wanted to have this image, you know, he would drink, but he didn't want anybody to know he drank and he, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. But he, and, he, and he's very popular in Italy today. He does, he's been doing a television show for years over there. You know, he's uh, in Italian, you know, Terrence is a, his career, it was all went back to Italy and he's, and he's, he's done very well for himself. And, and he was a nice guy. I liked him, but he, we were doing a scene. Have you, have you, have you seen the film? Yes. Okay. March we're, we're, yes, we're, I have. We're, we're getting ready to die when we're, we were at the, at the sandbags there. Yeah. And all these guys are coming down the hill at us. Correct. And, right. And, and you're, we're, and you're playing a Russian to be massacred there. And, and you're playing a Russian I, who's gone off and joined the French yeah. foreign Legion. Yeah. 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 And I'm right next to him. We're, we're together. We were together. Most of the picture. I was everywhere. He was, I was. So 
he, we're right next to each other, and and the camera is right in front of us, and they're shooting our reaction to these people coming down the hill. And Terrence stops in the middle. He said, I, I can't do this. He said, this is ridiculous. And I said, what's your problem? He said, well, they want me to, to give them a reaction to all these people, forces coming straight at us and everything, and all I see is the camera. How do they expect me to do this? I said, Terrence, that's what they call acting. That's what we're here for. <laughs> that's that's what job. it's all about. That's, that's the know? job. Uh, I that's, thought, you, all were really, they I thought you were really good in March or Die. I thought you were really good in Dragnet, and I thought you were really good in the Baltimore Bullet. And I, the, I love the story about uh, where, uh, you know, Moscone and, and Minnesota Fats and all these pool hustlers decided they wanted to play backgammon with Omar Sharif. And oh God, uh, he, 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 he skinned them pretty well. Uh, oh about, my. About 50 I, never saw, each, yeah. I never saw anybody take 50 grand off of people so quickly. He, was, he had just came off the plane and they were doing a, a makeup check on him and he's sitting in the chair and these guys, they couldn't wait for him to get there. All these hustlers from all over the place. Uh, Hopkins and all of them. They're good guys, but I, I mean, I related to all of them, but they, they were like vultures waiting for him. And, and they didn't realize that, you know, he was a great bridge player, but he also invented the first backgammon computer game. It was yeah. his, he owned that. So they, they, he come in the chair and he said, Oh man, how are you doing? Blah, 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 blah. Well, we like to play a little backgammon. And Omar said, hey, guys, you know, I just got off the plane. You know, give, give me a chance to catch my breath. And they said, yeah, well, yeah, as soon as you're done, we'd really like to sit down. And, and they, they were dying to play him backgammon. They thought they were going to hustle him. Yeah. And I never saw, and he said to me, come on, you got to watch this. This is going to be fun. And I said, I'm not a gambler. I said, yeah, okay. Why not? So I go over and I never saw anybody move a cube as fast as he did throwing dice, moving a cube. He took 50 grand off of these guys. They were, their mouths were, were falling off. And, and what's really funny is in Willie Moscone, not, not just a great pool hustler, but the actual hustler that taught Robert Newman how to hustle for the film, the hustler. Uh, it's pretty funny oh, when yeah. that's the guy yeah. that is. Moscone up, was a guy. Hey, let me tell you, let me tell you this, Jack, I, I got to end it with you. I hate it. I wish I could interview you for a week, but uh, <laughs> as I, I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. Oh, I, I, did. I had the privilege of interviewing George Christie one time on my radio show. And George was the president mm -hmm. of, of the Ventura charter of the hell's angels and was the international oh, yeah. spokesman for the Hells Angels. He's written the book Exile on Front Street. And I remembered thinking during the interview, I cannot believe I'm interviewing this guy, you know, as he told, as he talked about Altamont and doing the heavy lifting for the mafia and all the stuff he talked about. I, I remember thinking, and of course, being exiled on Front Street has a street meaning, you know. Well, the, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta go back to the very beginning of the Hells Angels. There was a kid named Drago. Yeah. He was from Blackwood, New Jersey. I knew him well. And he ran the San Francisco chapter of the Hells Angels. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and Jack, he talked about that too. But what I wanted to tell you was yeah. uh, there's the, the only other that, 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 that today in this interview, there were many times that I had that same feeling of I'm not good enough to be interviewing this man. I, 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 it's, it's, it's one of those, I'm not worthy moments. So Jack, oh, I, I can only tell you, uh, from the bottom of my heart that you've honored me with this opportunity. You have honored the listeners of the long version here on veterans day. Um, I, I love you for what you've done for a young guy. That's, that's trying to reinvent himself, um, for a guy that is, that is an outlaw as George Christie says about me, he says, boy, you really pissed somebody <laughs> off, but I, I love what you, I love what you've done for me. I love what you've done for the listeners at WLINY. Uh, I love you and I hope you'll come back again. But for all of us here at the long version, Eric Koppelman, Jack O'Halloran, and all of us, we're out. Can I just say one thing, Fletch, before we go out? Just yeah. Let me just sure. say, we got to give a special shout out to Steve Joyner again. I, I know we did it at the beginning, but I just want to say, you know, Steve, uh, you know, I called Steve the other day and of course he reached out to Jack and Jake, Jack graciously called me once again and, and, you know, agreed to come on. It's people like Jack O'Halloran that, you know, with regards to radio interviews and spending the time, 
it, it's such a really great thing, and I, I implore all of you out there. Family Legacy is such a great book. My wife actually texted me during the. She's like, "Did you get Jack's book? Because I want to read it." <laughs> you know, so <laughs> so you know, I said, "Hey, Linda, listen, I'll give Jack a call." <laughs> So, Jack, remember, when you come to New York, you know what I'm saying? we got to have that steak dinner. You know what I mean? So uh, we got to get together whenever you're ready. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. I look forward to it. Absolutely. Look forward to it. And, Fletcher, what a great interview. You sounded great today. I want to say it's an honor and a privilege, privilege to have your show on this network. So thank you, guys, both of you. All right? Fletcher, was great. Guys. Thanks. Anytime you want to chat, Fletcher, just call me. Wow. I, you there know, you I had go. a good Dude. time with ball. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Jack. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for the long version. Say it, Fletcher. Say we're out. Happy Veterans Day. We're out. I caught a charge again. I'm calling Fletcher Law. They searched the car again. They couldn't find nothing wrong. I caught a charge again. I'm calling Fletcher Law. They searched the car again. They couldn't find nothing wrong. Let me talk to my lawyer. Get him on the phone. The Bowtie Killer, a.k.a. When it comes to the law, I know my rights and when they're wrong When it comes to going to court, I tell my lawyer to pop on Cause me and the judges, we don't get along They always try to hit me with 1129 It's a court cost and fines and some charges that ain't mine They always try to say don't do the crime if you can't do the time But I just don't have the time, even when I do the crime They don't wanna see me shine, put me over, walk the line I told them that I'm trying, then they cut me, said I'm lying Then my mama started crying, cause I got another case And the judge can't see my face